Classic. What are you doing, bro? What do you mean? I'm just watching The Simpsons. You said you were going to film that Thomas Sowell video. I don't remember that. Mate, you said it like three years ago. Look. Hmm. That's an interesting claim because I'm an economist and I never hear anyone speak of these fallacies. I wonder what his source is. Sowell. Your time will come. Guess I better order his book then. <laughs> Young person I'd never met introduced himself to me and said that when he saw our guest today on an earlier episode of this program, he felt he was seeing a man who knew how to think. Dr. Thomas Sowell on Uncommon Knowledge Now. Thomas Sowell is an economist who works at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Do you know Thomas Sowell? I know that name. Why do I okay. know that name? He has released dozens of books on topics ranging from introductory economics to Marxism to education to race and culture. He's known for his uncompromising application of economic principles to argue for a free market capitalist economy, as well as his more general conservative views. Sol is extremely popular on the internet. His videos with the Hoover Institute have millions of watches on YouTube, including the documentary Common Sense in a Senseless World. Tom is fearless not just in advancing unpopular opinions, but in venturing into areas of scholarship that have been untrodden. You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. And that's what they're doing. They're, 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 they're just ignoring what he's uh, written because they, there's no way that they can argue with Tom Sowell. Sowell has been praised by prominent academics. The libertarian Friedrich Hayek claimed that Sowell's book Knowledge and Decisions was one of the best general economics books in many a year. Sowell has been called one of the towering American intellectuals of our time. His fans wonder why he is not more appreciated in academia and even question why he hasn't won the Nobel Prize. In a 2011 poll of American economists, he was ranked number 15 among economists over 60, the highest rank of any economist who hadn't won that prize. Milton Friedman, who taught Thomas Sowell at the University of Chicago, once said, the word genius is thrown around so much that it's becoming meaningless. But I think Tom Sowell is close to being one. Wait a minute. That's... That's a bit of an odd phrasing, isn't it? Hey guys, if you like the video, then comment below. The word video is thrown around so much these days, but this is close to being one. Sol is a black conservative who grew up in the Jim Crow South. He has, by all accounts, experienced some of the worst overt discrimination in modern history. He's been at the sharp end of Western civilization, yet remains staunch in his commitment to its values. Thomas Sowell, I told you about what a big fan I am of Thomas Sowell. I think it is extraordinary. In my view, he is the greatest black intellectual that has ever lived. It is for this exact reason that one article claimed that Thomas Sowell is the left's worst fear. I don't know about that. I mean, I'm on the left and I wouldn't say I'm scared of Thomas Sowell. I mean, I'm willing to engage with his ideas, I don't know. Jeez. Even Mike Tyson was spotted with a copy of Sowell's Basic Economics, a comprehensive guide to the subject and arguably his magnum opus. God, boxing is such a barbaric sport. Look at what being punched in the head for a decade does to someone. Okay, so let's, let's knock out the ideas. We're gonna deliver the knockout blow to Thomas Sowell's economics. We're gonna knock it out of the park. Oh wait, that's a different sport. Like Mike Tyson, I've been reading Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics. I've also read Applied Economics, which is the more advanced follow-up. And I've read Knowledge and Decisions, which is reportedly the one he is most proud of, the one Hayek praised. Whereas Basic Economics is a guide for newbies, Knowledge and Decisions is a bit more scholarly. What do I like about Sowell? 
Above all, I appreciate his attempts to communicate economics to a broad audience. In basic economics, he makes a point of avoiding mathematics and equations, sticking to plain English. Every voter and every politician that they vote for affects economic policies. We cannot opt out of economic issues and decisions. Our only options are to be informed, uninformed or misinformed when making our choices on issues and candidates. Basic economics is intended to make it easier to be informed. That's part of what this channel is all about. There wasn't that much economics on YouTube and what there was wasn't great in my opinion, so I thought I'd try to contribute. I've always been passionate about public education and economics, so Sol and I are on the same page here. I tend to use graphs and figures a bit more than he does, but I expect we share the idea that these need to be fully explained in plain English and used only when necessary, instead of getting lost in a forest of maths and statistics. Sol does write with clarity, and it's difficult to be unsure of where he stands on a given topic, something you can't say for every writer. I'm partially in agreement with Sol about the utility of markets and the failure of Soviet Union-style central planning. He makes some decent historical observations about the futility of trying to plan the economy 100% from the top down, and the perverse effects this had in the 20th century. I'm basically with him on this conclusion, albeit with some important caveats. I found several other parts of Sol quite interesting. The chapter of basic economics on productivity and pay contained parts which clarified my thinking. The section on the history of thought was pretty fun and I only wish it had been longer. No coincidence that that was his PhD thesis. The section on macroeconomics shows that Sol is wise enough not to be a gold bug. There's a whole section on the law in Knowledge and Decisions which taught me a lot about the history of the American legal system. And so on. Overall, Sol has an approach to economics which is sometimes useful in understanding key debates and which leads him to conclusions which make sense in those cases. He has a mission to communicate these ideas to the public with clarity, which is why he has released so many books and makes so many public appearances. Many people on my side probably dislike Sol, but I can genuinely say that I find it helpful to have somebody synthesize the free market perspective on economics and have it all in one place. Okay, with all that said, this is not a good book, and, and neither are his other ones. Thomas Sowell is extremely limited in the way he presents economics as just one set of ideas which should be applied relentlessly and unflinchingly. These tend to imply a particular set of free market policy conclusions which must be adhered to dogmatically, which are basically a template for how we should organise the economy which cannot be questioned. It's quite tricky to find Sowell coming down on a side of the debate that you wouldn't expect him to. So I hear people on television saying how the government can't afford to give, to give this tax cuts to the rich, you know, not giving anything to anybody. In that case, economics becomes a religion and books like this are basically a Bible. You see this frequently because people tell you to read Thomas Sowell as if you're going to have a conversion moment as the scales lift from your eyes. This is a bit like taking the red pill or even read theory, which you see more on the left. I'm sorry, they're all bullshit ways of avoiding an actual conversation. Something which seems to give Sol a bit of a boost in many people's eyes is that he used to be a Marxist. There's a sense that he's been there, done that, but when he learned the cold hard truths of economics, he realised that his utopian views were untenable. Everyone loves a convert and Sol's story is that when he studied policy, he realised that governments were doing more harm than good. Tom Sol looked at the data and the data found that minimum wage hikes uh, cause people who are unskilled to lose jobs. He found out that people in the government didn't give a rip whether or not it worked or didn't work. They were simply implementing the policy. And that, that's what shocked him and caused him to begin to rethink lots of his assumptions. So it wasn't uh, academia that caused him to become more conservative. It was real life working for the government. This road to Damascus moment is the key to Sol's image as someone who pays attention to reality and empirical evidence. He claims, as I learned more and more from both experience and research, my adherence to the visions and doctrines of the left began to erode rapidly. This is a persuasive narrative. He tried leftism and it didn't work. He understands the ideas and even why people want to believe them, but despite wanting to believe them himself, facts and logic just triumphed. A powerful narrative indeed, but demonstrably untrue once you interrogate his beliefs even a little bit. There are a few main issues with Sol as I see him. Firstly, he is extremely one-sided. He rarely acknowledges cases where capitalism or markets fail, whether those are theoretical or empirical. Virtually every case he reviews is done in a seriously biased way, and I can show you this repeatedly throughout the video. He often creates bizarre straw men and strange examples of opposing thinking, not giving his opponents their due. He puts things in quote marks that aren't actual quotes and treats them as if they represent opposing views. Secondly, 
Sol is quite casual in his use of evidence. There are sweeping claims that are just unsourced. He rarely delves into the academic literature, but prefers block quoting newspapers like The Economist, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal. He frequently spends too little time on individual cases to give them an honest, thorough examination. He just references them in passing. In many cases, the sources he uses do not support his interpretation if you go and check them, as I did repeatedly. In fact, they may outright contradict what he's saying. On the rare occasions he does review the academic literature, it's just not done properly. Thirdly, his perspective is out of touch with modern economics as a profession. This could be fine, except that the book calls itself basic economics, so you would expect it to give you an idea of what economists actually think. As somebody with a modern economics education who has taught basic economics, I can tell you that Sol is quite far away from the discipline these days. Economics textbooks are flawed, but they will give you a much more balanced picture of how market economies can work and fail. This book should really be called basic free market economics. I genuinely don't think you're going to learn much about economics from reading Thomas Sowell. Your time is better spent elsewhere. What I want to do in this video is not just to present a counter argument to Sol, to debunk him. What I want to do is present an alternative view of economics to Sol's, one that actually has a long history and I feel is much more helpful for trying to understand the subject, including key historical events. If you like Sol, then thank you for tuning in. I'm not expecting this video to change your mind instantly. This isn't a simple takedown. It's designed to plant the seeds in your head for what I see as a superior approach to economics than Sol's frankly glib and one-sided treatise. With all that said, there will still be plenty of time for dunking on Sol. Although in Britain, we just call it mugging someone off. You trying to mug me off? We're going to start by going through some historical examples, including hunter-gatherer societies and Alexander the Great, as well as the Industrial Revolution later on. I'm warning you that this first part might seem like a bit of a detour, but I promise you that it's going somewhere. One of the most glaring gaps in Sol's view is that he refuses to contextualize economics in history. All of history is flattened into either capitalist or non-capitalist economies, and capitalist economies are good while non-capitalist economies are bad. It is my contention that by centering history in our understanding of economics, we will come to radically different conclusions about capitalism, whether for good or for bad. We therefore need to do a bit of historical work before countering Sol's contemporary arguments. This will eventually lead us to the main point of this video putting markets in their place. Markets can be great, but Sol's framework for understanding them is not, and he drastically overestimates their benefits. To understand this, we'll start where Sol starts in basic economics, with the definition of the subject itself. You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. And that's what they're doing. They're, 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 they're just ignoring what he's uh, written because they, there's no way that they can argue with Tom Sol. Oh. I think I can give it a try. Economics is kind of a weird subject. For a long time, the study of economics was always paired with the study of other aspects of society. It was difficult to separate economics from politics, sociology, philosophy, and from morality. Pioneering texts in economics like Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations contain long sections on governance and history, and this is not to mention his earlier work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which has a self-explanatory title. It wasn't until the 20th century that economics began to extract itself from the humanities and become a standalone discipline. The definition of economics is itself new and has long been contested. Unlike the rest of his book, Sol's definition in economics is in line with the one used by mainstream economists. He goes with Lenore Robbins' famous 1932 definition, economics is the science that studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce resources which have alternative uses. Personally, this has always struck me as a strange definition. If you're new to economics, it doesn't give you much to go on and just raises more questions. If you were defining physics, you could simply say it was the study of matter and energy. If you were defining sociology, you could say that it's the study of society and social behavior. Almost every subject can be defined by what it is studying. Geology is the study of the earth and other astronomical objects. But human behavior as a relationship between resources and ends? Isn't that a specific methodological decision rather than an actual concrete thing you can point to and say, we study that? This is why I'd never say the Robbins definition to someone who asks what I do. After explaining to them that as an economist, I can't give them personal financial advice, I'd usually just say something like, I study the production and distribution of resources in society. People can generally grasp what I'm getting at with a definition like that. But Thomas Sowell doesn't like this type of definition. 
Perhaps most of us think of an economy as a system for the production and distribution of the goods and services we use in everyday life. That is true as far as it goes, but it does not go far enough. The Garden of Eden was a system for the production and distribution of goods and services, but it was not an economy, because everything was available in unlimited abundance. Without scarcity, there is no need to economize, and therefore no economics. If I were feeling charitable, I'd call Sol pithy. If I were feeling uncharitable, I'd call him glib. Needless to say, he'd probably be good at Twitter. There is actually a Twitter account that shares Thomas Sowell quotes and it has a lot of followers. Sowell has a tendency to be too clever by half, which is one reason his quips are popular on the internet. We can see this from the final sentence of the quote, which I've seen people repeat. Without scarcity, there is no need to economize and therefore no economics. This doesn't actually make sense. Economics and economize are two words which are obviously related but aren't actually referring to the same thing. Economizing is a way of doing more with less, avoiding waste and reducing expenditure. It's related to austerity, cutbacks and scarcity. The definition of economics goes beyond this. Clearly, economics can be about having more, not just less. Saying that no need to economize implies no economics is like saying that no need to socialize implies no sociology. It sounds halfway plausible until you realize that socializing has a narrower definition than sociology. It's a part of the story, but not the whole thing. You can swap out other words too. I could say that economics needs to center people because without people, there's nobody to economize and therefore no economics. You see? Wait until Tom Sowell hears about all the different definitions of the word set. If we don't set ourselves a goal, we'll get set in our ways and the sun will set on our settlement. Horrible. This actually reminds me a little bit of what Red Letter Media said about Yoda in his Phantom Menace review. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Can't anger lead to fear and fear lead to suffering and then suffering lead to hate? You see, when you have three totally interchangeable emotional states, they can't really be arranged in a certain pattern of logic. Anyway, I'm making a serious point here, which is that despite outward appearances of pithiness, Sol's definition is not properly thought through. Like sociology and socialize, economics and economize share an etymological root. That doesn't mean much beyond that they are related somehow. It doesn't imply that they are linked by cold hard logic in the way Sol seems to think. We can see this kind of problem in Sol's other argument for centering scarcity in his definition. To remind you, the Garden of Eden was a system for the production and distribution of goods and services, but it was not an economy because everything was available in unlimited abundance. This is once more too clever by half. It's true that the Garden of Eden did not feature scarcity and therefore was not an economy. What a beautiful garden. It's almost like paradise. It's a... Whee! <gasps> <gasps> well, hello. Aren't you hurt? Of course not, there's no pain in the Garden of Eden. It does not follow that scarcity is the most important concept when defining economics. While Sol may have demonstrated that scarcity is a necessary condition for an economy, he has not demonstrated that it is a sufficient condition. And actually, there is more to the definition of an economy than just scarcity. We can illustrate this with a simple example. Traditional hunter-gatherer societies. Nomadic peoples like the Australian Aboriginals have always operated in an environment of scarcity, much of it actual desert, and hunt and forage for what they need when they need it. Scarcity is therefore present, yet nobody would recognize their society as having an economy. The system of production and distribution is just not there. This is more than just definitional nitpicking. If you focus largely on scarcity, then you miss a little event. It's called the emergence of civilization. Hey everyone, Editing UE here. A couple of patrons have helpfully pointed out that I could be accused of flattening history myself a bit here. Firstly, I repeatedly use the term the Aboriginals to refer to indigenous peoples in Australia. That's not really the accepted term. Uh, the accepted term these days is indigenous peoples. Secondly, I did not want to imply that the groups that we call indigenous, whether in Australia or elsewhere, uh, didn't have any sort of surplus, didn't have anything that we would call civilization, because there were a wide range of different ways of organizing uh, society across Australia uh, and, of course, the world. And there is evidence. There's a book called Dark Emu, which points to some of the indigenous peoples in Australia having surplus 
and uh, therefore having an economy. So I just, I didn't want to oversimplify the history too much here. I wanted to give you a heads up. In conversations with my daughter about capitalism, Yanis Varoufakis discusses the emergence of modern civilization as a system not of scarcity, but surplus. First, hunting, fishing, and harvesting of naturally occurring fruits and vegetables could never yield the surplus, even if the hunters, the fishermen, and the gatherers were super productive. Unlike grains, corn, rice, and barley, which could be preserved well, fish, rabbits, and bananas quickly rotted or spoiled. Second, the production of agricultural surplus gave birth to the falling marvels that changed humanity forever. Writing, debt, money, states, bureaucracy, armies, clergy, technology, and even the first form of biochemical war. It wasn't until we had settled agriculture, which was able to produce an excess of grain, that we saw the construction of large-scale systems of production and distribution. As agriculture scaled, less of the population was needed to feed those who did not produce food. Systems of distribution, often exploitative and hierarchical, began to develop, as did a class of people who lived off the surplus generated by the farms. And as we examine these relations, what also becomes clear is that a state could never have been born without surplus, since a state requires bureaucrats to manage public affairs, police to safeguard property rights, and rulers who, for better or for worse, demand a high standard of living. None of the above would be conceivable without a hefty surplus to sustain all of these people without them having to work in the fields. Nor could an organized army exist without a surplus. And without an organized army, the power of the ruler, and by extension the state, could not be imposed. And society's surplus would be more vulnerable to external threats. Think about it this way. You can have an environment of scarcity which includes modern economies. Resources are not infinite, so although we live in an age of relative abundance, there is an ultimate scarcity which constrains the amount we can consume both as individuals and as a society. Soul is correct in this. Without scarcity, as in the Garden of Eden, you do not have an economy. Everyone can just have what they want all the time. But there is a class of societies that include scarcity yet are not recognisable as economies. Australian Aboriginals, nomadic Mongols, South Indian tribes, and countless hunter-gatherer societies throughout history. What these societies lack is a sustained surplus, which is produced and distributed. A modern economy therefore has two conditions. Firstly, there is scarcity so resources are not in extreme abundance. Secondly, there is surplus so that resources are not absolutely scarce day to day. Again, scarcity may be a necessary condition for an economy, but it's not a sufficient one. Only scarcity and surplus together make up what we would recognize as an economy. Also, I've refrained from saying this so far, but it's worth pointing out that Sol's counterexample is entirely made up, whereas my counterexamples are historical realities. There's probably a lesson in there that will recur at some point. To remind you, the definition of economics that Sol uses is, economics is the science that studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce resources which have alternative uses. By focusing on scarcity only, this misses the historical emergence of surplus as the basis for an economy. If you define economics as the allocation of surplus, then you raise different questions, as we'll see. Of course, it's not that Sol is entirely unaware of surplus, or what he might call wealth creation. It's that his definition only mentions scarcity, and this concept underpins the entire book, with him frequently restating or alluding to it. I'm not trying to make out that this alone invalidates everything he says, but it does give us a clue as to how to critique his understanding of economics. Let's do that with a simple case study. Alexander the Great. Is that right? Cool. One of the good things about the idea of social surplus is that it naturally adds historical specificity. By construction, we are not talking about civilizations that did not traditionally have a sustained surplus like the aboriginals. We are confining the application of economics to civilizations from ancient Sumer to Rome to contemporary capitalism. Still quite a wide range, but nowhere near as wide as souls. And the fact that this surplus changed over time is another instance of historical specificity. Sol's definition of economics causes him to flatten history in a way that is entirely unconvincing. Without having placed his definition in historical context, he cannot say where it doesn't apply, except 
to an imaginary situation, the Garden of Eden. Sol does not entertain the notion that different societies would have entirely different approaches to the production and allocation of the surplus, which do not follow his logic. I'm not a historian and I'm not here to tell you about how every ancient civilization worked and how that differs from modern economies. Fortunately, I don't need to, because Sol's discussion of these time periods is so poor that it barely warrants rebuttal. but I'm going to rebut it anyway. For example, he claims that policies which have led to rising price levels under Alexander the Great have led to rising price levels in America thousands of years later. You might wonder what kind of evidence he marshals for such an extraordinary claim. After all, Historians have trouble knowing exactly what happened in 300 BC, let alone why it happened. But that's all we get the first time Alexander the Great is mentioned. Maybe Sol's just hinting at something that he'll discuss in depth later. When Alexander the Great began spending the captured treasures of the Persians, prices rose in ancient Greece. That's it. That's the extent of Sol's proof that price increases in the modern USA followed the same laws as price increases in the Macedonian Empire. You may notice that apart from the sentence-long treatment of a hugely interesting and therefore contested historical event, he doesn't even make a comparative analysis. He doesn't even begin to demonstrate that the two periods followed similar patterns, and he can't because he only spends 40 words on the subject. Sol doesn't provide a citation for his arguments, but I got curious and did a bit of digging. I ended up spending half a day in an ancient economics rabbit hole, and to be honest, it was pretty interesting, so thank you, Tom. The first thing that struck me was the enormous amount of uncertainty and debate among ancient historians. Mark Corrigan from Peep Show summed this up best with his book, Business Secrets of the Pharaohs. What are the business secrets of the pharaohs? Well, look, the first thing is to acknowledge that the ancient Egyptian era is so completely different from our own that any cultural, political or business parallels that we draw between the two eras are, by their very nature, almost bound to be wrong. Oh, look who it is. Let me give you a little background on Sol's example. Alexander the Great was the ruler of the Macedonian Empire from 356 to 323 BC. From what is now Greece, he expanded parts of the empire massively to the east, conquering parts of Egypt, Babylonia, Persia, and even reaching as far as India. He is thought to have reigned over a period of relative prosperity for many citizens, though not for the victims of his conquests. Following his death, there were a number of political and economic convulsions, notably the inflation that Sol references. Sol is not precise or specific with his claims about inflation in this period. He seems to be alluding to the argument that as Alexander expanded east, he looted a great deal of silver. Silver was used to mint the currency within the Macedonian Empire, so such a massive expansion of silver would increase the money supply. This increased money supply would lead to higher prices of commodities as there was too much money chasing too few goods, bidding up prices. This is a classic example of a monetarist argument, uh, which is the view that Sol seems to hold to most closely. In fairness to Sol, this argument is not uncommon among economic historians and has been made by prominent economic historian Peter Temin, among others. But how do we even know this much about ancient economies? A quick investigation reveals some pretty important details. It seems the Babylonians kept remarkably clear data on the prices of several staples – barley, wheat, wool. These diaries also contain astronomical observations so they can be dated precisely, and they were kept for hundreds of years. Most tablets were, of course, lost, but there are still a few hundred around today. This is rare for ancient history. It's about as good as it gets for quantitative observations 2,000 years ago. It's really cool, actually, but even with these tablets, there are just massive gaps in the data. There are only four remaining tablets between 566 and 382 BC, for example. In The Treasures of Alexander the Great, Historian Frank Holt urges humility when dealing with these kinds of numbers. The ancient world certainly quantified itself on many levels, but the figures that happen to survive are so scattered, inconsistent and fragmentary that they cannot function in the same way as we expect of modern statistics. Working out anything as complicated as ancient gross domestic product, inflation rates, unemployment levels, or national debt from such numbers must involve massive guesswork to fill in the gaps. 
The Seleucid Empire in West Asia included Babylon as well as the rest of Persia. Alexander the Great looted silver and other treasures from this area, though whether he converted them into currency is less clear. It is likely that there was a spike in inflation in the conquered territories around this time, and especially after Alexander's sudden death in 323 BC. The inflation appeared earlier in Seleucid before reportedly spreading back to Greece, as Sol mentions. Drawing a causal line between the increase in silver and the scattered inflation across the empire is still a bit of a leap. Hull also states, a quantitative analysis of the Silus economy undertaken by G. G. Apergis supports the conclusion that inflation in Babylon was the result of political and military turmoil rather than the release of Alexander's coinage into the market. At Amphipolis in Greece, a inscription records two sales of the same property in different years of the late 4th century BC both times for the same price, showing no signs of inflation that region's housing market. No literary sources describe for Alexander, as they do for Augustus, a rise in real estate prices due to an influx of plunder. The attractive old theory that Alexander endeavored to promote economic expansion through a calculated increase in the money supply is slowly but surely Dying. So there may not even have been inflation back in Greece. We do have more reliable measures of inflation in Babylon thanks to the tablets, but it's just as possible this came from war and political upheaval as from an increase in the money supply. The laws of economics, or the laws of everything being super complicated and uncertain, that won't catch on. In a mere 40 words, which contain exactly zero sources, Sol manages to make a number of claims which are so contestable that they were qualified or disputed in virtually everything I read on the subject, even things that broadly supported his interpretation. Peter Temin, while pushing the idea that inflation in the Macedonian Empire was monetarist, clearly states that what he's saying is highly contested and that there are huge gaps in what we know. And all of this is before we even attempt to make a comparison to the USA. Evaluating Sol's comparison would be hard because he doesn't specify the period in the USA's history he's talking about. If I had to hazard a guess, I'd say that he was talking about inflation in the 1970s and 80s, the worst modern example of American inflation when it reached 13%. This was a period characterized by an oil shock, a breakdown in labor capital relations, and the USA leaving a metallic standard for money. None of those three factors appear to be present in ancient Babylon. Look, maybe there was inflation in Greece because of an influx of silver under the rule of Alexander the Great. The point I want you to remember is this. You're not going to learn much about it from reading Thomas Sowell. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Sol's ancient history isn't the best, but why are you so focused on this? Why don't you focus on the strongest points of the book? This one doesn't really matter, surely. First, we've got a long way to go and I'll get there, believe me. We'll return to macroeconomics and inflation in part two. Yeah, there's going to be a part two. Let me tell you why I've highlighted this section. It's illustrative of the general outlook of Sol and those like him. They think that economics gives them a ready-made set of laws that they can apply across history, often without sufficient understanding of the period they're studying. Here is the full quote from the first time Sol mentions Alexander the Great. These basic principles of economics apply around the world and have applied over thousands of years of recorded history. They apply in many very different kinds of economies, capitalist, socialist, feudal, or whatever, and among a wide variety of peoples, cultures, and governments. Policies which led to rising price levels under Alexander the Great have led to rising price levels in America, thousands of years later. Rent control laws have led to a very similar set of consequences in Cairo, Hong Kong, Stockholm, Melbourne, and New York. So have similar agricultural policies in India and in the European Union countries. What I hope to show you in this video is that economics is at its best when it acknowledges historical specificity. Thinking that we have laws which we can just apply to whatever time and place takes our fancy is intellectually lazy and arrogant. Not understanding the details can lead to serious and avoidable errors. There may be tendencies, useful theories, and successful short-term predictions in economics, but we should never mistake them for eternal laws. Throughout this video, I want to show you how Sol's understanding of economics falls apart if you actually take a good look at the individual cases and their nuances. When I was 18, I applied for my first full-time job. The application seemed like it was for an administrative position, but when I got there, they surprised us. It was door-to-door -door sales. Great. 
I was one of those companies that preys on teenagers desperate for work by lying to them. Anyway, before I mustered up the courage to tell them I didn't want to do the job, I found myself venturing out into the suburbs. I remember the salesman giving me a whole spiel about how the job would always make money because people would always buy cable TV, the thing we were selling. People will never turn around and say we don't want more channels and higher quality TV. They'll always want more, the salesman rabbited on into my ears as I wondered how to get out of the situation I was in. In a way, he was right. TV consumption has only grown over time, and since the pandemic, hours watched has just ballooned. We are watching more television than ever, probably more than he imagined, with unprecedented variety and convenience. In another way, he was wrong. TV has gone online, so cable TV doesn't even exist in the same way it did in 2010. There aren't that many people selling it door to door or really selling anything door to door these days. So that job has become obsolete, contrary to what the salesman thought. Why am I telling you this 4 out of 10 story about my life? Because this random salesman's reasoning was better and made me think more than Thomas Sowles did. In the previous section, we were discussing Sowell's definition of an economy and how he centers scarcity. Eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed, however, that his definition of economics as a subject has another component, which is how those scarce resources are allocated. Remember, economics is the science that studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce resources which have alternative uses. How to allocate resources naturally brings up questions about who gets what. For Sowell, this leads us to think about what people desire and how they'll use the limited money they have to fulfill those desires. What does scarce mean? It means that what everybody wants adds up to more than there is. This may seem like a simple thing, but its implications are often grossly misunderstood, even by highly educated people. For example, a feature article in the New York Times laid out the economic woes and worries of middle-class Americans, one of the most affluent groups of human beings ever to inhabit this planet. Although this story included a picture of a middle-class American family in their own swimming pool, the main headline read, The American Middle, Just Getting By. His example is a New York Times article profiling a number of middle-class families, some of whom feel they are struggling. Sol thought that they couldn't be struggling because in the picture, one of the families had a swimming pool. Wow, a lot of people have pools. Is this proof that people are never really satisfied with what they've got? Hey, turns out that the internet is a thing. Why don't I go and read the whole article to find out more about this pool? Long quote incoming. The unlikely owners of the backyard pool are Sean Brandyberry, 25, a data manager, and his wife, Tulena, 24, as evangelical Christians hoping to spend at least some of their time in missionary work. The couple shun material trappings. For them, a rising income is the road to financial independence, not to a home with a backyard pool. That is how a lot of people define their lives, by how much they have, Mr. Brandyberry said. I am not saying we are above that thinking, we clearly aren't, but we try not to let it be a conscious force driving our lives. The article explicitly and vividly rebutes the notion that their pool is a symbol of material affluence. It sounds like they didn't really want it, it's just that the house they found in that area already had one. All they're aspiring to do is to own a house to gain financial security. Shelter is a basic need, hardly the best example of relentlessly pursuing superfluous material goods, especially because the article states that they are evangelical Christians who are actively trying not to be too materialistic. They even had to dig dirt and junk out of the pool to make it usable. The pool came with the 30-year-old two-story, four-bedroom home in Springfield Township that they acquired last year for $65,000 in an estate sale. The pool was filled with weeds and dirt, the house run down. I thought I would fix it up and sell it at a profit, Mr. Brandyberry said. But with two infants and three more children planned, his wife wanted bigger quarters than the two family duplex in which they had lived the previous 18 months, occupying one apartment and renting out the other. So they moved into the new house themselves. Don't get me wrong, I don't feel terrible for this couple the same way I feel terrible for someone picking litter in Ghana just to scrape by. But given the passage I just showed you, is it not simply dishonest to summarize their situation as they say they're struggling, but they have a pool? They have a mortgage, which is more than twice their income, and being in debt can be extremely stressful, even if you're rich. When you're concerned you may go bankrupt and fail to provide your family with a home, you're not just some spoiled middle-class American. Read in full and honestly, this is actually a pretty interesting article. It contains a number of themes. 
the unfulfilled promises of middle-class life in 90s America, the modern consumerist drive to keep up with the Joneses and whether it's worth it, how expensive housing is and how families struggle with this basic need, the challenges of having children, the different types of families and how they resolve these puzzles for themselves. For Seoul, though, this is all collapsed into this article shows people always want more, even when they have a swimming pool. Wow, a lot of people have pools. Even though the article ends with somebody literally stating that they have enough. Mrs. Jones remembering driving with a friend who was talking about remodeling and enlarging her kitchen. And I thought to myself, isn't this big enough? It's plenty big now, she recalled asked me a couple of months ago, when were we going to upgrade our kitchen? And I said my kitchen was big enough. Somehow, this article is Seoul's only, only evidence that people always want more than they have. Even if it supported his interpretation, it wouldn't be enough. And if this is his reading of an article in the country that he lives in, written at a time when he was alive, I can only imagine how poor his comprehension of the Macedonian Empire must be. You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. I'm emphasizing this not just to point out how Seoul's sources don't support him, although I am doing that and it will be a theme, but because it brings us to the idea of needs. People do go into debt for silly reasons, for sure, but most of the debt in the article is from people buying houses, cars for transport, often to work, and things for their children. They're trying to attain what most people would regard as needs. Thomas Seoul does not believe in needs. No, seriously. He has an entire section devoted to refuting the idea that needs can be distinguished from wants. One of the most common, and certainly one of the most profound, misconceptions of economics involves unmet needs. Politicians, journalists, and academicians are almost continuously pointing out unmet needs in our society that should be supplied by some government program or other. Most of these are things that most of us wish our society had more of. What is wrong with that? Let us go back to square one. If economics is the study of the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses, then it follows that there will always be unmet needs. Some particular desires can be singled out and met 100%, but that only means that other desires will be even more unfulfilled than they are now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you spot that? Why does the second paragraph switch from needs to desires? halfway through. Is it because you can't even pretend to your own brain that they're the same, Tom? Let's read that again. If economics is the study of the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses, then it follows that there will always be unmet needs. Some particular desires can be singled out and met 100%, but that only means that other desires will be even more unfulfilled than they are now. If economics is about the allocation of scarce resources and people will always desire more, and remember, he didn't prove this with the New York Times article, the only source he used. Then it does not follow that needs specifically will always be unmet. They may be in a distinct category to wants or to desires in Sol's own words. He reinforces how weak his point is because rather than choosing examples of things people actually deem needs, food, healthcare, education, housing, he constructs a thought experiment about, of course, Car parks. Anyone who has driven in most big cities will undoubtedly feel that there is an unmet need for more parking spaces. But while it is both economically and technologically possible to build cities in such a way as to have a parking space available for anyone who wants one anywhere in the city at any hour of the day or night, does it follow that we should do it? Well, no it doesn't, which is why nobody is calling for that. Transport is a need, but people usually call for transport in general. People need to get around to work for their social lives, for their freedom. But they don't need parking spaces. That's why there are campaigns to nationalize trains and make tickets free, but not to nationalize and expand car parks. Oh, thanks DSA. They did later disavow this tweet in favor of public transport. I've probably said I need my back scratched in the past, but that wasn't a political call for an army of human back scratchers or for the universal provision of plastic ones. Although now that you mention it. The funny thing is that Sol makes such a poor case for giving up on the idea of needs that I think I can present the argument better than him. Consider the following propositions. First, needs are difficult to define. There are some blurry boundaries between a want and a need. Second, once defined, the necessary amount of a given need is equally hard to determine. Third, both the need and the amount of it will change over time and across different societies. Does the fourth proposition follow? There is no such thing as a need 
as distinct from a want. This is conceptually tricky. Much ink has been spilled trying to define needs. In On Human Needs, Kate Soper outlines some of these intellectual challenges. How can it claim that the needs for which it speaks have that objective status that was deemed to distinguish needs from wants? If any statement of needs is a statement of value, and if any genuine statement of needs is made in acknowledgement of its normative character, then what distinguishes statements of need from statements of want? We know that people need food and each person has some kind of necessary intake, let's say in calories for the sake of simplicity. Some need different types of food to others, while some just have more in general. Men need to eat more calories than women, on average. People eat more and have more varied diets now than in ancient Babylon when they relied more on grains. So even this basic need has transformed over time. Sometimes, something which seems superfluous is actually just the modern way to satisfy a need. It's all well and good to admonish families for complaining when they have a big fridge, but where else are they going to store the kind of food you can buy these days? Are they going to put it out in the snow like people did in the Middle Ages? On the other hand, is a big fridge really a need? My schoolmate used to have a fridge of legendary size filled with goodies. They didn't need that, although it definitely made them some friends. Who would loot through their fridge in search of Rockies and Derrily Dunkers, much like Alexander the Great looting through Persia? While needs may be tricky to define, moving from that to needs are impossible to define is a pretty clear example of sophistry, blurring lines and acting like nothing really means anything, man. Do you believe in God? And I think, okay, there's a couple of mysteries in that question. What do you mean do? What do you mean you? What do you mean believe? And what do you mean God? The boundary between tall and short is not clear cut. The boundary between tablet and laptop is not clear cut. Just look at this. Ooh, turns into a tablet. I'm not gonna juggle it. The boundary between animal and plant is not clear cut. Have you ever seen a leaf sheep? Because you should. They photosynthesize, but they move around like slugs. Just look at them. Do we therefore say that tall people, laptops, and animals are useless concepts? Of course not. This has been called the precisional fallacy. The precisional fallacy is often used polemically. For example, an apologist for slavery raised the question as to where precisely one draws the line between freedom and involuntary servitude, citing such examples as divorced husbands who must work to pay alimony. However fascinating these where-do-you-draw-the-line questions may be, they frequently have no bearing at all on the issue at hand. Wherever you draw the line in regard to freedom, to any rational person, slavery is going to be on the other side of the line. On a spectrum where one colour gradually blends into another, you cannot draw a line at all, but that in no way prevents us from telling red from blue in the centre of their respective regions. To argue that decisive distinctions necessarily require precision is to commit the precisional fallacy. You want to know who wrote that? Thomas Sowell in Knowledge and Decisions. If only he'd applied this to the debate between wants and needs. People sometimes say, that works in theory, but wouldn't work in practice. With needs, the idea is hard to define in theory, but easy to understand in practice. Most humans can rattle off a list of about 10 or so needs we have, and will tend to agree on the broad categories, even if the specifics are up for debate and change over time. The best way of illustrating this is through the idea of essential workers, which came up during the COVID lockdowns. When lockdown hit, almost everyone understood immediately that farmers, train drivers, and builders were firmly within the essential worker camp. Everyone also understood immediately that jobs like economist, YouTuber, and author were not as important because they did not fulfill people's needs. There was no room for sophistry when the pandemic hit. If it didn't provide us with food, shelter, transportation, entertainment, and so on, it wasn't actively produced. Non-essential workers stayed at home for months. The boundaries were blurry, there was debate over whether school teachers were essential, and they worked more during later lockdowns than earlier ones because people were more worried about missing a lot of school than a little. Nevertheless, there was a big class of jobs which fulfilled needs and a bigger class of jobs which did not. A given society at a given time will not have too much trouble splitting its workers into these essential and non-essential categories. In case you weren't convinced that needs don't exist, Sol follows this all up with a reductio ad absurdum. The very word needs arbitrarily puts some desires on a higher plane than others as categorically more important. But however urgent it may be to have some food and some water, for example, in order to sustain life itself, nevertheless, beyond some point, 
both become not only unnecessary, but even counterproductive and dangerous. Widespread obesity among Americans shows that food has already reached that point, and anyone who has suffered the ravages of flood, even if it is only a flooded basement, knows that water can reach that point as well. In short, even the most urgently required things remain necessary only within a given range. We cannot live half an hour without oxygen, but even oxygen beyond some concentration level can promote the growth of cancer and has been known to make newborn babies blind for life. There is a reason why hospitals do not use oxygen tanks willy-nilly. Yeah, man, you say you think healthcare is a need? Why don't we just give you all of the treatment in the world? All the antibiotics, antiacids, laughing gas, heart surgery, dialysis. You wouldn't like that, would you? Not all at once. Therefore, healthcare isn't a need. Ben Shapiro apparently once said that Thomas Sowell could defeat Thanos with logic. But if this is the best he can do, I reckon Thanos would absolutely destroy him. The debate between needs versus wants is age-old and extremely interesting. But you're not going to learn much about it from reading Thomas Sowell. Now, at this stage, whether or not... Now, at this stage, whether... Now, what are you doing? Watching. Watching you. Why? I'm always watching. I know a lot about you, especially your internet history. Is that a big deal? I know everything you've searched, things you've bought. So what? I've got them, you haven't. I know your incognito search history. It's 2024, mate. Nobody cares about that kind of thing anymore. I know all of the basic economic terms that you've Googled. Fuck. Why did they never teach us what amortization meant? If you want to avoid bad actors documenting every embarrassing definition and jargon term you should know but instead have Googled multiple times, then you can use Surfshark VPN. They also protect you against less important things like having your data stolen, viruses being hacked, being tracked, and so on. I've been using Surfshark VPN because, to be honest, I've had a few problems with my online security. Just recently, I was almost the victim of a worryingly convincing banking scam. Fortunately, they managed to amortize my finances back to where they needed to be. Hmm. If you want to keep yourself safe online, then you can sign up by following the link in the description and using the code UNLEARNECON to get the first three months for free. Surfshark VPN also have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't like it, then you can just fucking cancel it, all right? We good? Now, at this stage, whether or not you agree with me, you might wonder, am I going somewhere with this? Am I just going to fisk the entire book? That's fisk with a K, by the way. It means to criticize an argument line by line. Actually, I am going somewhere. There's a reason Soul has to resort to such terrible arguments here. If needs are real, then there is a natural question which follows. Is it possible to structure the economy in such a way that everyone's needs are met. This chimes with the surplus view of economics we detailed earlier. If economics is about allocating the surplus of the economy, then we might ask who produces that surplus and who gets it. In the past, agricultural workers produced the grain that rulers, bureaucrats, and priests lived off. This kind of thinking even raises moral questions, which is exactly what Sol wants to avoid. In his view, Economics just describes how inherently scarce resources are allocated between alternative uses. None of the alternative uses have higher moral worth. As he says of the New York Times article, middle-class Americans' desires exceed what they can comfortably afford, even though what they already have would be considered unbelievable prosperity by people in many other countries around the world, or even by earlier generations of Americans. Yet both they and the reporter regarded them as just getting by, and a Harvard sociologist was quoted as saying how budget-constrained these people really are. But it is not something as man-made as a budget which constrains them. Reality constrains them. There has never been enough to satisfy everyone completely. That is the real constraint. The original definition of economics in terms of scarcity depends on a debatable commitment to the idea of infinite wants, which Sol himself does a really bad job of proving. We cannot fulfill infinite wants, but we can fulfill finite needs. If there's plenty to go around, we can start to think about surplus and even abundance. If we take the view that people have needs and that there is a social surplus over and above what people need, then we can simply ask whether that surplus is used to fulfill those needs. We can also ask, who are the essential workers? Who is most directly responsible for providing our needs? And how are they getting on? That's a political as well as an economic question, which leads us nicely to the key question of how Sol thinks our current economic system works. But first, 
To summarize the early part of the book, Sol's definition of economics centers scarcity but neglects the emergence of surplus as a necessity for an economy. He denies the existence of needs in favor of a view where inherent scarcity is allocated between competing desires. He does not manage to justify the idea that there is no such thing as needs because his logic is sloppy and his facts are poorly sourced. He therefore evades the crucial question of where the surplus comes from and who it goes to for what purposes. Owing to his ahistorical approach to economics, he shoehorns contested events into his modern framework with little success. Okay, so that's uh, chapter one and a bit out of 27. Oh dear. Like most people who use the internet too much, I've probably got undiagnosed ADD, and I recently discovered magnesium glycinate tablets which are good for sleep and focus. I'd recommend them for anyone who has trouble with either or both of those things. I used to take them before sitting down to read a chapter of basic economics, but even though they greatly enhanced my focus, I still found Sol's books absolutely mind-numbing at times. And I'm used to reading about boring economics stuff. One of my favorite books is Seeing Like a State, for Christ's sake. Have you ever tried to read that book? It's boring, but amazing. Soul is just boring. Why am I telling you this three out of 10 story about my life? I think the repetitive nature of Soul's book is important in itself. He repeats certain phrases quite a lot, not least the allocation of scarce resources, and goes over many of the same case studies and sources. I think I even spotted outright repetition a few times. We can see this most clearly with the first half of the book. To start, we get a discussion of what economics is and the role of prices in allocating scarce resources. Then we move on to how prices and markets work, outlining the role of prices in allocating scarce resources. We get a discussion of price controls, or what happens when prices are not allowed to operate, including an extensive discussion of Soviet-style centrally planned economies. This underscores that prices are the best way to allocate resources because in their absence, bad stuff happens. We then get an overview of prices, which is somehow different to what's come before. We move on to industry and commerce, discussing the rise and fall of businesses, how prices work to send signals for what should be produced in a market economy. After this, Sol has a chapter called The Role of Profits and Losses, which is about how profit and loss provide signals for what should be produced in a market economy. After this, it's the economics of big business, which reiterates the same basic logic for big business. After this, it's regulation and antitrust laws, which critiques attempts to regulate big businesses because they will interfere with market signals. Then we again discuss market versus non-market economies, including the failure of central planning. We move on to work and pay, and the chapter on productivity and pay actually isn't bad and introduces some new ideas. Then we discuss minimum wage laws, which reiterates that price controls like the minimum wage and the labor market are bad, just as they are bad everywhere else. Look, you get the picture. Now that we're done with the historical background, we can move on to concrete questions about how contemporary capitalism works and indeed, whether it works at all. According to Sol, economics is about the allocation of scarce resources which have alternative uses. As he says, the natural question is how to determine the best of these alternative uses in the face of this inherent scarcity. As we've seen so far in this video, I'd be more likely to ask how we use our historically unique surplus to fulfill human needs and flourishing. But let's put that to one side for now and just understand Sol's case for markets and capitalism on his own terms. Sol believes that markets are by far the best system we have because they effectively communicate production capabilities and consumer preferences across an economy filled with millions of people and countless goods and services. The key drivers of this success come from both the businesses who make the products and the customers who demand them. If people want something, then they will buy it, so the businesses that produce it make money. But if something is produced, which is not in demand, the business that produces it will make a loss. This is a clear signal that resources should no longer be put into that use. Although people often focus on profits, loss is, if anything, more important. This is an area where Sol is echoing his mentor, Milton Friedman. It's often described as a profit system, but that's a misleading label. It's a profit and loss system. And the loss part is even more important than the profit, because it's what gets rid of badly managed, poorly operated companies. Since we are talking about allocating a resource to one use over the other, a key concept is substitution. Most resources have multiple uses and can be put into different products. The market is therefore continuously engaged in a process of swapping resources between alternative uses as circumstances change. Sol uses the example of milk. You can use milk itself, or you can use it to produce derivative products like cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. 
In paying for cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, consumers are in effect also bidding indirectly for the milk from which these products are produced. In other words, money that comes in from the sales of these products is what enables the producers to again buy milk to use to continue making their respective products. When the demand for cheese goes up, cheesemakers use their additional revenue to bid away some of the milk that before went into making ice cream or yogurt in order to increase the output of their own product to meet the rising demand. When cheesemakers demand more milk, this increased demand forces up the price of milk to everyone, including the producers of ice cream and yogurt. As the producers of these other products raise the prices of ice cream and yogurt to cover the higher cost of the milk that goes into them, consumers are likely to buy less of these other dairy products at these higher prices. Every time I read that passage, it just makes me hungry. Sol argues that with consumer demand revealing what people want and businesses responding to the profit and loss signals this generates, resources are allocated to their best uses. Since scarce resources have alternative uses, the value placed on one of these uses by one individual or company sets the cost that has to be paid by others who want to bid some of these resources away for their own use. From the standpoint of the economy as a whole, this means that resources tend to flow to their most valued uses when there is price competition in the marketplace. Businesses compete for customers, but customers also compete with each other by bidding away items from their current use when they offer to pay more for them. Sol is keen to emphasize that this doesn't mean that all production will be oriented to the highest bidder, it's more of a process. Some people pay more so production is gradually reoriented towards their preferences without outright eliminating other uses. There could be a surge in demand for yogurt, but that wouldn't mean ice cream and cheese stopped being produced entirely. Just that they were produced less or were more costly because resources were instead flowing into the booming yogurt industry. Now I'm hungry again. Sol's view of markets captures an important truth. In my opinion, markets do two things. First, provide a signal to people that something is in demand. Second, through buying what is demanded, allocate resources to that use so production can continue and expand. You can have one of these without the other. Charity appeals, requests from a friend, or engagement on social media may provide a signal that something is in demand without the concordant increase in resources to fulfill that demand. On the other hand, the state allocates resources without the corresponding market signals. The government sends resources to post offices in rural areas, not because people offered to pay for them, but because of other considerations like equality or democracy. Markets provide both the signals and the resources at once without direct centralization, which is why they are a pretty neat tool. As CJ the X has put it. Sometimes, just sometimes, capitalism is kind of cool when you make something good and then people give you money and then you use their money to make another good thing. Sol is completely right here, but this is where the one-sidedness comes in. He doesn't give nearly enough credit to the obvious ways that markets can fail to provide what people need. It's not that Sol never mentions market failures. He does acknowledge some of them. But he spends little time on them, and when they do come up, he's always playing down the harm from markets and playing up the harm from whatever government intervention might be carried out to fix the problem. If you're naming your book Basic Economics, then this is actively dishonest. An education in basic economics will give you a lot of ways free markets go wrong, along with empirical examples of it actually happening and governments actually fixing it. You know, putting markets in their place. To get us started, here are some basic examples. Monopoly. If businesses can overcharge for something, then the price does not represent the true value, but the market power of the business too. Customers have little choice in the face of monopoly, so their bids in the marketplace are biased. They'd like to pay less or buy different stuff, but they don't have the option. The same applies to workers or smaller businesses who are reliant on the monopolist. External effects. Those who are not involved in a market transaction may be affected by it, whether positively or negatively. Buying petrol and using it to power your car causes local pollution as well as climate change, plus all the other horrors associated with cars. The signals sent by the buyer and the seller therefore do not reflect the true value of the activity of buying and using petrol. Information problems. If market participants do not truly understand the transaction, it's absurd to argue that they have the correct value for it, most people do not have the information on every available alternative they could have chosen, so they cannot make these pristine relative comparisons, substituting one thing for another. You likely don't know the price and quality, even of all the basic goods in your local area, like groceries. It's much less likely you have a good idea of the ins and outs of various insurance plans or financial investments. In the extreme, information problems are just fraud. 
misinforming consumers about what you are selling them. Irrationality, or as I prefer to call it, the human factor. Even when people have the information in principle, they may not be able to act on it due to cognitive limitation. People don't really know what they want a lot of the time and even less what to pay for it. You can easily be prompted to pay a particular price by environmental cues. Companies, of course, take advantage of this. Not too long ago, we had Black Friday. But you know Black Friday is basically a scam, right? Companies just say things are on sale even though they're the usual price. Loads of people fall for it, even though the scam is kind of transparent and information about it is public. Even outside of Black Friday, sales and buy one get one free have been used in this way for decades and people still fall for them. The prices seem better when there's an offer, even though the offer continues indefinitely and makes the company sound profits. Detailing these market failures one by one could form the basis for an entire video or series of videos. If I were more of a mainstream kind of economist, then this is how I'd respond to Sol. And the fact that he doesn't take all of these problems seriously enough is exactly why economists don't take him seriously anymore. If you post the word Sol on the Academic Economics Discord server, you will get the automated reply. Tom Sol is not and and never has been an economist. Dad. That was really mean. You could even say, you're not going to learn much about basic economics by reading Thomas Sowell. The field has just moved away from a wooden insistence that market failures are minimal or difficult to fix. Mainstream economics has so many examples of these that it is pretty ridiculous to act like they're ignoring Sowell's arguments, which only use the most narrow and basic version of the theory. You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. Sol believes that a free market capitalist economy does a better job of allocating resources than any other type of economy, and especially that stymieing markets leads to inferior outcome. Yet such a die-hard view is quite vulnerable. If you just proceed on a case-by-case -case basis, taking each market as it comes, it's easy to find examples where the non-free market set of policies is clearly better for more people. As Jeffrey Friedman put it in his sharp critique of libertarianism, Those who favor departures from laissez-faire, even when their aims are, like Honderich's, radical enough to qualify as socialists, do not, after all, make the unequivocal claim that government action will always tend to produce better results than private property. Thus, their evidentiary burden is lighter than those, like Conway, who implicitly make the opposite claim. In the post-communist era, the antagonist of classical liberalism is not likely to believe anything more sweeping than that state action may be needed whenever civil society fails. The questions the libertarian must answer, then, are how often civil society does fail and how often the state is liable to do better. The interventionist can be an agnostic about such general questions, treating each potential civil society failure, i.e. social problem, case by case. It is the libertarian who is committed to the grand claim that, for some reason, intervention must always be avoided. It is a high bar to have to prove that government intervention into markets will almost never work. Even a modest, centrist amount of pragmatism is enough to falsify hardcore libertarianism. Sol has to spend less time on cases where government works and, when he stumbles across one, just flatly misrepresents the sources he does use to make it seem like it was a success of the free market, or he pivots to blaming the government somehow. In this video, I'm going to spend some time on just one market failure. Monopoly. Businesses with more revenues and profits can exert more influence over industries. This is true whether or not they're outright monopolies. Sol does write a fair amount about Monopoly, more so than most of the other examples, so it's a good choice to see how he handles market failures. While it's welcome that he does this, once again the writing can feel one-sided, tedious, and repetitive. You know how, sometimes on campus you accidentally walk by a business class and the professor is writing like, profit equals revenue minus costs on the board, and everyone is taking notes like it's actual school? Yeah. A cruise ship, for instance, must receive enough money from its passengers to cover not only such current costs as paying the crew, buying food and using fuel, it must also be able to pay such overhead costs as the purchase price of the ship and the expense of the headquarters of the cruise line. This would be fine except that he writes out this kind of thing for almost every industry he mentions. I almost died reading this book. Sol acknowledges that monopolies are a problem in principle. He states that they would transfer resources to the monopolist through excessive prices faced by consumers. Even more, monopolies misallocate resources. When a monopoly charges a higher price than it could charge if it had competition, consumers tend to buy less of the product than they would at a lower competitive price. In short, a monopolist produces less output than a competitive industry would produce with the same available resources, technology, and cost conditions. 
If I were to sum up Sol's argument about monopoly power, it's that private monopolies do exist, but they are often short-lived and always face the possibility of competition. Even when a company seems dominant, they have to make sure they are working efficiently, otherwise they'll be displaced. This is illustrated by the high turnover among the top firms, which shows that the market economy just keeps getting rid of even the biggest firms once they become redundant. The businesses we hear about in the media and elsewhere are usually those which have succeeded, and especially those which have succeeded on a grand scale. Microsoft, Toyota, Sony, Lloyds of London, Credit Suisse. In an earlier era, Americans would have heard about the A&P grocery chain, once the largest retail chain in any field anywhere in the world. Its 15,000 stores in 1929 were more than that of any other retailer in America. The fact that A&P has now shrunk to a minute fraction of its former size and is virtually unknown suggests that industry and commerce are not static things but dynamic processes in which particular products, individual companies and whole industries rise and fall as a result of relentless competition under ever-changing conditions. There's some truth to this, but note that saying big companies will eventually be replaced isn't actually a direct defense of their behavior. As long as they are around and dominant, these companies can lead to problems for consumers, workers, governments, communities and smaller businesses. In order to evade this obvious point, Seoul does a typical pivot to how it's all the government's fault. Fortunately, monopolies are very hard to maintain without laws to protect the monopolistic firms from competition. The ceaseless search of investors for the highest rates of return virtually ensures that such investments will flood into whatever segment of the economy is earning higher profits, until the rate of profit in that segment is driven down by the increased competition caused by that flood of investment. It is like water seeking its own level. But just as dams can prevent water from finding its own level, so government intervention can prevent a monopoly's profit rate from being reduced by competition. We are then treated to a story of how monopolies were originally granted by the government through corporate law, something we'll discuss later, and how this continues today with licensing laws, which are a pet peeve of free market economists. This may all be true as it goes, but it runs directly into Jeffrey Friedman's objection. The problem for Seoul is how easy it is to demonstrate clear and significant cases where the non-interventionist stance does not work. It's telling, for instance, that many of Seoul's examples in these chapters are of consumer goods. He details cameras, televisions, supermarkets, planes, newspapers, cars, petrol, McDonald's, computers, and the like. I tend to agree that competition may triumph over the long term with goods and services that consumers buy regularly and where there are plenty of options, where technological change seems to advance inexorably. But there are important areas where this is less relevant, like utilities or heavy industry. Seoul again makes great hay out of the idea that consumers can substitute to other things if there's a monopoly in one market, but it's hard to substitute away from, say, the global logistics network. Anyone remember this image? In 2021, the Ever Given container ship was lodged in the Suez Canal for six long days, creating a massive queue which reached almost 400 ships by the time it got moving again. Multiple tugboats and dredgers were needed to dislodge the Ever Given, and one unlucky person actually died in the process. The cargo was going from Taiwan to the Netherlands, but it caused long-lasting problems for ports and companies around the world, with the impact stretching as far as Sao Paulo in Brazil. The ship trapped in the canal was an almost too on-the-nose symbol of the general problems with global supply chains over COVID, which saw obscenely large queues in ports. Sailors had to sit on container ships for days, even weeks, while the goods they had were unavailable, stuck below rows and rows of containers. Yet the spectacle of these clogged ports was just the most visible part of some worrying trends in global shipping and logistics over the past few decades. The top 10 ocean carriers today control over 80% of the market, twice as much as they did in 1998. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, sorry. I'm just getting something in here. Thomas Sowell doesn't like the word control. A standard practice in American courts and in the literature on antitrust laws is to describe the percentage of sales made by a given company as the share of the market which it controls. By this standard, such now defunct companies as Pan American Airways controlled a substantial share of their respective markets, when in fact the passage of time showed that they controlled nothing, or else they would never have allowed themselves to be forced out of business. The severe shrinkage in size of such former giants as AMP likewise suggests that the rhetoric of control bears little relationship to reality, but such rhetoric remains effective in the courts of law 
and in the court of public opinion. As well as the repetition of the example of AMP, which he mentions many times, this is a good example of how Sol gets his knickers in a twist about phrases he doesn't like. Late in the book, he actually has a whole section about how we shouldn't use certain words, but use his words instead. Maybe he wouldn't like the phrase knickers in a twist. It certainly used to annoy me when I was having a tantrum and my parents said it to me. The tantrum's just gonna get worse if you say that, mum. Anyway, even from the quoted paragraph, Sol is clearly equating control with absolute control. If someone were to describe a partner from a previous relationship as controlling, would that be contradicted by the fact that they weren't with them anymore? That they were able to leave the controlling relationship eventually doesn't imply it couldn't be characterized as controlling. Obviously, there are degrees of control, there are domains where there is more control, and these both change over time. By a similar token, large companies do exert some control over their industries, workers, and over governments. Craig Fuller, the CEO of shipping news company Freightwaves, has estimated that the shipping of goods makes up about 12% of the global economy, while about 40% of the global economy is dependent on it indirectly. More than 60% of the world's consumer goods are shipped. And the fact is that a handful of mega companies have had a disproportionate amount of control over this central part of the global economy, and they are running it in a way that leads to obvious logistical problems. Maybe Seoul is right that market share isn't the best measure of the control of certain companies. With that in mind, let's look at the specific characteristics of shipping and how its dynamics are controlled by the decisions of big players. Over the past few decades, the industry has become more concentrated, which has spelled problems for potential competitors and the shipping system as a whole. It's easy to focus on the virus and the lockdowns, but the monopolistic shipping industry made the system more vulnerable to such a shock. The rise in the size of shipping companies has coincided with technological developments which have increased the size of ships themselves. These days, container ships are so big that the image conjured up by saying the word ship doesn't really do them justice. The Ever Given is literally as large as the Empire State Building. So if it gets trapped, then there's going to be an issue. Rather than a steady trickle of goods, US ports have found themselves dealing with occasional massive deliveries from these skyscraper-esque boats. The larger the ship, the larger the port required to dock it. As ships have grown, an increasing number of ports have fallen into relative disuse, with a reliance on larger ones like Los Angeles at the expense of smaller ones like nearby San Diego. This is a kind of Tetris problem of matching ships to the right ports. <laughs> if there is less variety in ship sizes, certain slots are less likely to be used so the queue will just get bigger. As shipping expert Mark Levinson put it on the Odd Lots podcast. These mega ships have generally fouled up the uh, transportation system, okay? You actually have fewer ships calling at most ports today than you used to have. They're much bigger. And so think of what this does to the operation of the port. You don't have a smooth flow of cargo going through the port. Now, You've got nothing happening in the port. It's dead today. And then tomorrow, a ship shows up and it wants to unload 3,000 containers in your port. What do you do with this? How do you get it unloaded? Where do you put the containers? One thing that's happened is that ships spend more time in port, which is very wasteful because it just takes more time to get so many containers on and off. The trucks are lined up at the gate because there's so many containers to bring in to send out on these ships or so many containers to deliver. The railroads can't handle this sudden flood of containers. So you have the cargo sitting around longer before it gets removed from the port. All of these things have tended to make transit times longer uh, and have made it harder for shippers to get their freight where it's supposed to be on deadline. And that's bad for everybody. So the approach of these mega shipping companies doesn't line up with what's best for ports running smoothly. This is a clear example of the perils of monopoly and oligopoly. And this is all a direct consequence of deregulation. When we're talking about deregulation in the USA, we all know who's to blame, right? Are you sure it's a federal law that I have to dance with you? You know, I'd change that law if I could, Marge, but I can't. The Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 1998 abolished what was previously a transparent system where everyone paid the same shipping fees and there were subsidies to US carriers. Since then, the governance of the system has become less transparent and large companies like the Danish firm Maersk dominate, operating as a cartel with the other big companies, according to industry insiders I've spoken to. 
And yes, that is real. The fees have become less transparent. The system has stopped operating efficiently on a physical level, and the companies have doubled their market share. The massive ships and containers they hold are so expensive that it's difficult for new firms to enter the market and compete. Ports themselves are beholden to the massive firms because they provide so much of their custom. There is currently legal action being taken against Maersk Co for price fixing, a clear sign of abuse of monopoly power. There are other examples of the market not physically working as it should. For example, it can be more profitable for a big ship to unload in LA and head straight back to China empty than for it to load up to take American exports back across the Pacific Ocean. As one observer put it, the ships operate in only one direction. A carrier between California and Beijing may haul commodities eastbound but not westbound, for example, thereby doubling the cost to consumers, who must pay enough freight charges to cover the cost of the ship both ways. The physical realities of empty ships traveling so far with nothing in them even though agricultural exporters are directly demanding that they can use the ships, seems to be a glaring example of a poor allocation of scarce resources which have alternative uses, to use Thomas Sowell's phrasing. And if you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound so bad to me, does it really double the cost to consumers? I don't believe that. I'm sorry to inform you that I've been very sneaky again. That one was a quote from Thomas Sowell with a couple of the nouns changed. In Knowledge and Decisions, he criticizes the regulatory authorities for creating a situation where trucking in the USA is more expensive than it needs to be. The full quote reads, It is to the regulatory agency's political advantage to satisfy, or at least appease, as many incumbents as possible, which is to say, to distribute these operating rights widely, and therefore thinly. Thus, legal rights to engage in interstate trucking are spread so thin that they are often rights to operate in only one direction. A carrier between between the Pacific Northwest and Salt Lake City may haul commodities eastbound, but not westbound. For example, thereby doubling the cost to consumers who must pay enough freight charges to cover the cost of the truck both ways. Seoul and those like him have the unfortunate handicap that they almost always feel the need to blame the government for problems. When poor regulation and monopoly both lead to virtually the same concrete problem, empty trucks or empty ships, I've got no trouble saying that both are bad outcomes. I expect that Seoul would argue that the supply chain crisis was the result of government, and I've seen unconvincing attempts by other libertarians to do so. They largely amount to rants about regulations and unions, failing to grapple with the specifics of the issue. I searched about, for instance, and found Peterson Ange of the Cato Institute claiming of the port crisis. So what is driving the chaos? Government, along with union chokeholds, environmental and labor mandates on truckers, mandates on supply chain workers across the board, crony trade restrictions, and excessive unemployment benefits nationwide, but especially in California. Clearly, this is too general to be convincing. Unemployment benefits? Environmental regulations? California? This is just what American right-wingers always complain about. There are no concrete attempts in the article to link these things specifically to the crisis in the way that we link them to the size of the ships and the monopolies in the market. Hello, another edit. Uh, in the interest of trying to be completely fair to everybody, I want to highlight that there were a couple of specific acts in this article. Now, the article is by and large a very general rant and there's a lot of fluff in it, but on a rereading, I noticed the AB5 law and the Jones Act highlighted by St. Onge as causing the supply chain crisis. I stand by what I said. There's really just an argument by hyperlink here. There's not a concrete attempt to link it, these things to the supply chain crisis. Uh, the AB5 law restricts gig workers and independent contractors, but as we'll see, it obviously hasn't done a massively good job because independent contractors in the ports are still pretty common and they have massive problems, so I don't think it can be attributed just to that. The Jones Act is more about favoring American companies in uh, intra-American deliveries, uh, and it seems to have affected mostly Puerto Rico. Again, is it linked to the supply chain crisis? Only in the most general sense. So I just want to underscore that this is generally a bad article. It offers a couple of hints of how regulation could be bad. I am not against repealing bad regulations, as I make clear repeatedly. Um, but, I, you know, I just wanted to be as fair as possible and say that maybe these things do play a role. St. Onge doesn't do a great job of 
approving it, though. European ports, as a point of contrast, have resisted deregulation and functioned much more smoothly than American ones, where the crisis was at its worst. As early as 2015, the Federal Maritime Commission warned of the problems with ports, with underinvestment caused by both governments and the private sector, abuses by private companies which were underregulated, and yes, some regulations which weren't fit for purpose. This report is a nuanced, in-depth view of the problem, unencumbered by the insistence that the private sector is automatically better than the government. Sadly, nobody read it because nobody reads reports from the Federal Maritime Commission. Seoul's own example of trucking has aged poorly too, as the same report details. Again, I'm entirely willing to acknowledge that transportation industries like US shipping and trucking were over-regulated or misregulated when Seoul was writing knowledge and decisions in the 1970s. But since then, the industries have been deregulated massively and there are a whole raft of new problems. Truckers no longer have the type of serious employment protections they used to. This time, the deregulation was done by that true champion of the free market, Jimmy Carter. I uh, give you our 39th president, Jimmy Carter. Oh, come on! He's history's greatest monster! Jimmy Carter began to deregulate the industry in 1980. The Motor Carrier Act was the same one Sol was objecting to when he said that it led to empty trucks. Let's grant this as a bad feature of the bill. The issue is that the MCA did other things which turned out to be quite important. Abolishing the act abolished the minimum standards that truckers had grown used to. Owing to the 1970s economic crisis, which saw recession and rising inflation, exactly like under Alexander the Great, remember. There was an appetite for a change in economic policy. These political wins meant that truckers were unable to prevent deregulation, as well as the not entirely inaccurate image of their union leaders as sexist, racist barons with links to the mafia. Whatever the causes, Carter's deregulation made it much easier for independent truckers and small businesses to enter the market and compete, which led to a reduction in wages and standards across the board. As Sol points out, this did increase competition and reduce prices, but it came at a cost. Today, literally 94% of truckers in the USA quit within one year. 94% quit. Not stay, only 6% stay. The American Trucking Association estimated that the USA was 80,000 truckers short in 2021, with the number set to increase in the future. Truckers were previously able to collectively bargain their wages and conditions through unions to ensure a stressful job was at least stable and well remunerated. Now, on top of all the health problems that come from sitting down all day and spending a long time away from their families, truckers can no longer say they have a lifelong job which will provide for their families. When you disregard such difficult yet crucial professions, you can't be surprised when people opt out and the whole thing crumbles. Like the clogged ports, the shortage of truckers which came to the fore during COVID has been a long time coming. And if you think that the shipping workers are doing okay out of all of this, then, well... Crew members aboard ships, meanwhile, are not reaping any of the industry's rewards. In fact, with many shipping delays, instead of switching crews at the port after the end of their contracts, companies are forcing their crews to work well beyond the end of their contracts with very little, if any, additional compensation. The crew was mostly Filipinos who were subcontracted by a hiring agency, and the officers were all German. The differences in wages were about $3,000 per crew member at the same rate, depending on if you were German or Filipino, Charmaine Chua said. This turned out to be too costly for the company, so they started to move to a flag of convenience model and fired all of the German crew on the ship, which means that everybody worked at a lower wage. It's all very well for Thomas Sowell to take objection to words like controlling, but I'm not sure how else to describe the hold these companies have over global shipping. Maersk has existed for over a century, so it hasn't been displaced by the relentless forces of competition, and they have quite clearly completely changed how the industry works. Oh yeah, and it just happened again too. As Jeffrey Friedman pointed out, The interventionist can be an agnostic about such general questions, treating each potential civil society failure, i.e. social problem, case by case. It is the libertarian who is committed to the grand claim that, for some reason, intervention must always be avoided. Even a single example like Maersk and Global Logistics can demonstrate the need for better policy to improve outcomes and put markets in their place. The Biden administration actually enacted, or at least threatened to enact, a number of policies to get the ports moving again, including more transparency about fees and fines for stationary boats. Whether or not these are the best approaches remains to be seen, but one thing is for sure... <laughs> but one thing is for sure... You're not going to learn much about this by reading Thomas Sowell. That's right. 
You know how your boss sometimes sets a project for you, but doesn't bother to monitor or research the damn thing themselves? Instead, they just go off to meetings and on trips that make them feel important. At some random point, they swoop back in mid-meeting to complain that they don't understand what's happening, then demand that everyone who's actually been working on the project make changes that don't make any sense so that the boss's authority is maintained, even though their net contribution to the project is probably negative. For some reason, in the 20th century, a lot of nominally left-wing people decided that this would be a pretty good way to run an entire economy, except with a lot more blood as the leaders used force to make everyone comply with their wacky top-down schemes. Aside from being a monumental failure and having a huge human cost, this handed capitalists a massive W and they haven't stopped talking about it since. Central planning is defined as an economy where centralized authorities plan what industries across the country make, how much of it they make, where it goes, how much it costs, payment plans for workers, and so on. In practice, it varies in the level of detail governments go into, but one thing's for sure, it's a pretty far cry from a market economy. Centrally planned economies lack incentives for efficiency because there is no threat of bankruptcy from producing inferior products. Instead, any threats are political and come from displeasing the higher-ups. There is little negotiation by decentralized parties so that people cannot respond to changing economic conditions. Consumer demand is barely involved at all, so you cannot be sure that what is produced is what people want. Although in the case of this toy hedgehog, it was definitely what people wanted. As this killer meme points out, Sol's book is the perfect antidote to the Communist Manifesto. That's a 20-page pamphlet versus a 600-page book. Hardly a fair comparison. I do kind of wish that the manifesto hadn't been written or wasn't so well known. It's just the easiest way to miss the point. The fact that, that you assume a priori that all the evil can be attributed to the capitalists and all the good that the bourgeoisie and all the good could be attributed to the proletariat meant that you could hypothesize that a dictatorship of the proletariat could come about. In Knowledge and Decisions, Thomas Sowell actually quotes Marx and Engels favorably as being against central planning. So, shockingly, this thread from 4chan lacks veracity. Only the best insights at unlearning economics. Central planning is probably Thomas Sowell's favorite example for proving why markets and capitalism are superior to other types of economies as he puts it. One of the best ways of understanding the role of prices, profits, and losses is to see what happens in their absence. Socialist economies not only lack the kinds of incentives which force individual enterprises towards efficiency and innovation, they also lack the kinds of financial incentives that lead each given producer in a capitalist economy to limit its work to those stages of production and distribution at which it has lower costs than alternative enterprises. Sol presents historical evidence from the Soviet Union showing central planning failed due to misaligned incentives. As with capitalism, he emphasizes not the individuals, but the system. People were behaving rationally given their situation, the outcome was just undesirable. Everyone was gaming the system in predictable ways, which led to massive waste and other absurdities. Sol gives a whole bunch of examples of these absurdities, to start with just one. Two Soviet economists, Nikolai Shmelev and Vladimir Popov, described a situation in which their government raised the price it would pay for moleskins, leading hunters to get and sell more of them. Quote, state purchases increased, and now all the distribution centers are filled with these pelts. Industry is unable to use them all, and they often rot in warehouses before they can be processed. The Ministry of Light Industry has already requested Goskompson, that's the committee which controls prices, twice to lower purchasing prices, but the question has not been decided yet. And this is not surprising. Its members are too busy to decide. They have no time. Besides setting prices on these pelts, they have to keep track of another 24 million prices. You'll get no disagreement from me on these perverse characteristics of a centrally planned economy. But even though I broadly agree with Sol on this, I still find his viewpoint extremely limited. In typical Sol fashion, he is sloppy with his sources. He relies almost exclusively on one book called The Turning Point, Revitalizing the Soviet Economy by Shmelev and Popov, published in 1989. That's where the quote about the pelts came from. The term Soviet economists appears over 20 times in basic economics, and in every case, he is referring to the turning point. He also has this weird way of introducing it as if he hasn't done so before? Page 67. In the Soviet Union, where price controls were more pervasive and longer lasting, two Soviet economists wrote of a grey market where people paid additional money for goods and services. Page 161. Two Soviet economists estimated that the costs of components used for machine building enterprise in the USSR were two to three times as great as the costs of producing those same components in specialized enterprises. Page 163. Two pages later, as two Soviet economists pointed out, two Soviet economists, 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 two
properly. Let your reader know that it's the same source they've seen before. Even more than that, use another fucking source. Hey, it turns out the internet is a thing. Why don't I take a look at this book myself? Okay, so when researching for this video, I had planned to read The Turning Point because Sol uses it so extensively. We already know that Sol is suspect when it comes to representing his sources accurately, like the New York Times article, but I still wasn't prepared for what I found. Warning that this is another long quote, but it's necessary when the first fucking page reads like this. But if the reader expects to find analysis and conclusions hostile to socialism, and the social system that has evolved in our country, read no further. While we unconditionally respect the right of every nation to choose its social system, national priorities, and human values, we also believe in the historical advantages of the collective, socialist organization of society. Although this type of social organization has not yet realized its potential, we attribute our past and present economic difficulties to the fact that all the principles of socialism have not been followed so far, and we pin our hopes for a better future on these principles being fully embodied. The essence of today's perestroika is in gradually putting socialist ideas into practice and stripping socialism of the alien veneer it has acquired. Shmelev and Popov ward the reader away from one-sided anti-socialist conclusions in the first page, yet Sol uses the book to steer the reader towards those exact conclusions. Recall that Sol's point with central planning is not just to show that that specific system fails, but to prove that free market capitalism is the best option. Clearly, the authors of The Turning Point disagree vehemently, which he might, you know, want to mention at least once? You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. I knew he was one-sided, but I wasn't prepared for it to be this bad. You should have seen my reaction when I read that first passage. It was genuinely something like this. Oh my fucking god. You may argue that just because Sol doesn't show the nuance in Shmelev and Popov's book, it doesn't mean the examples of the numerous absurdities of central planning that he takes from the book are wrong. After all, the turning point does give the reader an in-depth look at the ins and outs of the Soviet economy, and there are enough ridiculous examples to fill up a whole video. Somehow, I doubt people would be happy if I took such a one-sided approach to quoting Sol, and in fact, I will inevitably be accused of doing so. Sol's approach would be like me claiming that he just ignores the market failure of monopoly, despite everything he says about what causes monopolies, why they're a problem in principle, but are usually the fault of government intervention. Remember how I didn't do that, but instead went into detail on how even his more nuanced view was wrong? Exactly. No doubt. Central planning was a poor system overall, especially for consumer goods. It was characterized by breadlines, inferior products, absurd inefficiencies, corruption, and in the early years, outright starvation. Yet Sol's use of it against socialism and government intervention in general is dishonest, not least because the history of the Soviet Union reveals a lot of complexity. Shmelev and Popov themselves are fans of the new economic policy, the one pursued by Lenin in the early days of the USSR. You could loosely characterize this period as one of market socialism. Markets and private enterprise were allowed, but they were heavily regulated. There were state-granted monopolies running industries, but if they stepped out of line, the government intervened further. There were systems of subsidies and price regulations to ensure that growth was maintained. On top of this, there was a huge cooperative sector. Credit, production and agriculture all saw collectively organized forms of production run by workers and communities. There were problems over this period, including price gouging and inefficiencies typical of monopolies. But the state gradually worked out these problems not simply by withdrawing, but by intervening further. The NEP saw sustained GDP growth, and by 1926, the Russian economy had reached the level it was in 1913, before World War I, the Revolution, and the Civil War. Industrial production increased more than threefold over this period. Even more than that, it was the socialist parts of the economy, not the private ones, that grew, as Shmelev and Popov detail. But perhaps the most important, and without exaggeration, the most historically significant result of NEP was that the impressive economic successes were achieved on the basis of unprecedented, fundamentally new social relations. It was precisely the socialist economy that grew so rapidly. Although there was a private capital sector in the economy, it did not play a decisive role. State trusts held the key positions in industry. The state and cooperative banks held them in finance and small-scale farms involved in the smallest forms of cooperatives dominated agriculture. 
interconnected through the market and regulated by the state, these cells of the socialist economy revealed a great capacity for coordinated interaction and balanced, stable development. For the first time in history, here was proof that a society formed on a collective basis that used the state-regulated mechanism of market self-adjustment as a primary motor and regulator of growth could attain successful economic progress. Their book is a little dated and new information has come out since it was published. But remember, this is Thomas Sowell's own source, the one he cites most often to prove that socialism doesn't work. They clearly see the socialist new economic policy as a model and spend time emphasising that its success was a success of socialism. Sowell does mention the NEP very briefly when he says, Thus began Lenin's new economic policy, which allowed more market activity and under which the economy began to revive. As we have seen, this is a shallow interpretation of the policy. Centrally planned, it wasn't. But socialist? Maybe. Markets existed more than in the later Soviet Union, but they were put firmly in their place. Seoul is just not prepared to grapple with the way the Soviet Union changed over time, the areas where it was successful, and the different ideas this gives us of what socialism might mean. All interesting debates, for sure, but... You're not going to learn much about them from reading Thomas Sowell. I could go further here, and to be honest, I want to do a whole video on central planning. I actually hadn't planned to focus on it this much until I read The Turning Point and realised how dishonest Seoul had been. In summary, Seoul is largely correct about central planning, but arguing that free markets are universally the best because central planning doesn't work is a bit like arguing that cars are universally the best because square wheels don't work. Yes, it's a shitty idea but there are a whole range of other ways to get around. Insisting that critics of capitalism have been proved wrong by central planning is just being stuck in the debates of the 20th century and avoiding contemporary arguments about our economic system and how to improve it. In order to understand this economic system much better, I want to return to another historical event that's curiously easy to miss when reading Thomas Sowell. It's called The Emergence of Capitalism. I was recently in London, walking around. I know, I know, it sounds like a pretty wild story, but just suspend disbelief for a second. I had some time to kill between lunch with a visiting friend and the football game I was playing later. It was cold, so I wanted to be indoors. I'd already eaten, had a coffee, sat in various cafes and so on, but I had plenty of time remaining before the match. I really didn't want to eat or drink anymore before playing sports. I couldn't. Going home would have been silly. It was an hour away. As soon as I'd arrived, I'd have had to leave. The problem was that I didn't really have anywhere to go. Cafes and pubs don't tolerate people just sitting there without buying anything, but I didn't need anything. I found myself either buying stuff I really didn't want or just standing outside in the cold. It's not that I couldn't afford it. I just didn't want or need to buy anything at that time. I'd even have paid to sit somewhere, but that brand of business isn't exactly a money spinner in central London. I found myself looking for some kind of public space where I could just, you know, be. Why am I telling you this 2 out of 10 story about my life? It is my contention that this is a type of imposed scarcity. While Thomas Sowell claims that scarcity is just reality, we live in an economic system where people are shut out if they don't have money, or even if they just don't want to spend money at that time. The desire for non-capitalist institutions I experienced that fateful day is as old as markets themselves, and it goes back to the birth of capitalism. Strangely, Sol doesn't spend much time on the birth of capitalism in his books. Personally, I'd begin a book explaining economics and praising capitalism with a history of capitalism, but that's not how he does it. The historical evolution of capitalism is something that's worth investigating, not least because it coincides with a massive rise in the surplus available to humanity. Obviously, Sol is more than aware of the increase in material living standards that resulted from capitalism in the Industrial Revolution, and he repeatedly celebrates it. Yet he only really mentions it in passing, it's not a huge part of his analytical framework. I searched, and it seems that when he discusses the Industrial Revolution, it's usually as an example in the context of other things, how it relates to population growth, for example. If you're celebrating capitalism, then it's kind of strange not to explore directly what gave rise to it. You know, what happened here. This historical omission doesn't in itself mean the rest of Sol's analysis is wrong, but I'm going to hazard a guess and say that once more, the reason he doesn't give this topic its due is because it raises some uncomfortable questions. You might be expecting me to bring up things like the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, land enclosures, and working conditions. I'm not going to focus on these directly, important though they are. Mia Mulder's recent video on the economy, which is 
just as long as this one, goes into more detail from that angle. Sol has a tendency to downplay things like slavery and colonialism when he speaks about them, but I'm not going to touch that now. What I'm concerned with are conceptual questions about markets and how they allocate resources. Questions that go against Sol's cookie-cutter approach and instead emphasize the historical specificity we explored earlier. Because once we understand what changed when capitalism emerged, we can see a lot of room for distinction where Sol engages in conflation and again flattens history. As he put it in an interview, Wealth is created uh, when the circumstances are such that people who know how to create it are free to do so. This is a subtle commitment to laissez-faire capitalism that supposes that this system simply allows the free allocation of resources, resulting in wealth generation. For Seoul, it seems, the important distinction to make is between capitalist economies and everything else. In capitalist economies, prices and profits help to coordinate economic activity, while in other kinds of economies they are suppressed. Where markets are suppressed in this way, resources are not allocated to their best uses, and material progress cannot be achieved. In a feudal economy, the lord of the manor simply told the people under him what to do and where he wanted resources put. Grow less barley and more wheat. Put fertilizer here. More hay there, drain the swamps. It was much the same story in 20th century communist societies, such as the Soviet Union, which organized a far more complex modern economy in much the same way, with the government issuing orders for a hydroelectric dam to be built on the Volga River, for so many tons of steel to be produced in Siberia, so much wheat to be grown in the Ukraine. By contrast, in a market economy coordinated by prices, there is no one at the top to issue orders to control or coordinate activities throughout the economy. So for Seoul, there's the decentralized system of market exchange, then there's more or less everything else. One of the premier historical observers of the emergence of the system of market exchange was, of course, Karl Polanyi. The Macedonian Empire in the time of Alexander the Great surely had some kinds of markets, as did plenty of other ancient civilizations. But these were usually confined to a few commodities like barley and cloth. Civilization entailed some kind of trade, and even hunter-gatherer tribes traded, if infrequently. What Polanyi called the market economy was something different. In his famous book, The Great Transformation, Polanyi characterized the spread of the market economy as hinging on three things. Markets in land, markets in money, and markets in labor. These commodities were not bought and sold regularly until the Industrial Revolution, which is why Polanyi called them fictitious commodities. Establishing them as things to be valued, bought and sold was far from an easy or natural process. They're much more difficult to define and exchange physically, and are intertwined with human needs and morals in a way that grain and clothing are not. For centuries, Landlords would have been horrified by the idea of selling their land, which was part of their inherited dynasty and therefore not exchangeable for mere money. It was only as the merchant class grew and challenged the landlord's power that the latter realized that if they couldn't beat them, they'd have to join them. Getting involved in capitalism was motivated by preservation of the landlord's power rather than just material gain, though of course that was a bonus. Prior to this, most people had access to land and could feed themselves instead of buying food. This didn't mean that there was no famine or exploitation, far from it. But people were attached directly to their basic means of subsistence. Peasants and serfs worked on the fields and could get their tools from the local blacksmith in direct exchange for food produced for communities. Fluctuations were real, but largely due to weather or political strife, and communities had means of insurance for their members. Polanyi saw that the market economy cut through these traditional, informal ways of providing for ourselves and for each other, exchanging or gifting items and helping people out who fell on hard times. The more dependent on markets we became, the less people could rely on these kinds of bonds. Once the land was sold, peasants no longer had access to it and became reliant on selling their labor to capitalists to get the money to pay for the food which was produced elsewhere in the market economy now. People could no longer guarantee that they'd be employed, much less that they'd be paid enough to feed themselves. Before this, peasants were guaranteed work and at least the possibility to produce, but with markets came mass unemployment, as not everyone could find a job in the new system. Unemployment is a persistent feature of capitalist economies throughout history. The point is not that everything was fine and harmonious before capitalism came along. Nor is it that there were no markets at all before capitalism. It's that the unmistakable shift during the Industrial Revolution saw more and more things brought into the market, upending traditional ways of living and drawing more and more people into the burgeoning industrial factory system. This meant an enormous growth in the total surplus available to the population, 
but this surplus was not accessible to all. Access to basic needs like food or shelter now depended on access to the market economy, so people found themselves unable to get by due to forces outside their control. As Joseph Stiglitz put it in the foreword to Polanyi's Great Transformation, Rapid transformation destroys old coping mechanisms, old safety nets, while it creates a new set of demands before new coping mechanisms are developed. A paper I referenced earlier by Peter Temin is quite telling. You know, Temin of maybe Seoul is right about inflation under Alexander the Great fame. He tests for the existence of markets in ancient Babylon by seeing if the prices followed what's called a random walk. This is kind of what it sounds like. In a random walk, at every step, the price can shoot up or down. Once it's gone up or down, its next step will depend on the one before, and so on, just like walking. Random walks produce volatile patterns like these. These two graphs show the prices of barley and of wool in shekels over the years 417 to 72 BC. They are only annual observations, but you can see quite a lot of variation in the prices of both over time. Temin tests the prices of grain and wool in ancient Babylon using modern statistical techniques. He concludes that they were indeed markets because they follow a random walk, a pretty common test in the academic literature. I'm not sure if Temin's conclusion is justified. I've discussed the limitations of the data, taken as they are, from those piecemeal ancient tablets. The crucial point is that Temin sees this volatility as evidence for the existence of markets. In other words, even though Temin is actually quite critical of Polanyi's history, he accepts the point that markets are volatile, reacting as they do to a wide range of conditions across a whole economy, not to mention things like overreactions and bubbles. In The Treasures of Alexander the Great, Frank Holt underscores this conclusion. In Babylon, the survival of documentary evidence for commodity prices, barley, dates, sesame, wool, etc., provides a unique view of economic life during and soon after Alexander's reign. We learn that butter remained a common practice and barley continued to function as money and very often served as payment for wages. Prices remained extremely volatile, but inflation low over the long run, except for the period 330 to 300 BC, when prices spiked with devastating effect. In May of 325 BC, for example, grain and other goods were at first completely unattainable and later attainable only at erratic prices. Imagine this kind of volatility, not just in the prices of a few select commodities, which you may or may not have to buy, but in every commodity you bought, as well as in your own income. People would not be able to subsist reliably under capitalism and they would turn against market institutions for exactly that reason. Stiglitz again sums it up. Workers, farmers, and small business people will not tolerate for any length of time a pattern of economic organization in which they are subject to periodic dramatic fluctuations in their daily economic circumstances. There is a concordance between Polanyi and Sol. Both believe that the spread of the market economy was the most important factor in creating the Industrial Revolution and therefore the growth of living standards. The difference is that for Sol, Labour, land and money are just another entry in the list of resources which have alternative uses. Markets are the best way to allocate them to their best uses. For Polanyi, the emergence of these three things as commodities was a historical curiosity, whereas for Seoul it's just the world transitioning to the best way of doing things. The thousands of years without widespread land, money and labour markets were treated as an aberration, even though their introduction was slow and contested at every step. Seoul is a fan of private property rights because they create wealth, but he just doesn't engage with how people are shut out of wealth by those same property rights. It's telling that even today, Polanyi's fictitious commodities of labour, land and money are some of the most hotly debated areas of the economy. This is especially true when you bear in mind that nowadays, land means both housing and the environment, each contentious issues in their own right. Polanyi was extremely concerned about the destruction of the natural world resulting from markets in land. People are still outraged when they or others are not paid enough to get by, hence campaigns for things like the living wage and pushes for unionisation. They are equally outraged by high unemployment. People are outraged when the cost of housing is so high that it takes up most of their income, or they have to move away from where they want to be, or in the worst case scenario, they are sleeping on the streets. People are outraged when oil dug up from the ground leads to pollution and climate change. Sol is willing to acknowledge that different things are different, and there are several chapters of basic economics called Special Considerations of X, including Special Considerations of 
labor markets. He seems to concede that since labor is humans, allowing it to be traded on markets willy-nilly may conflict with some basic moral principles. For example, excessively long working days, child labor, insufficient wages to live, and so on. We'll do labor in much more detail in part two, Electric Boogaloo. Still, he doesn't take these insights anywhere near far enough. As volatility became more common across the economy, it sparked what Polanyi called the double movement. When markets spread, ways of protecting people from them spread too. Examples include protectionist measures like the Corn Laws in the 19th century, which tried to protect farmers from international competition, the Spenumland system of welfare payments to the poor around the same time, modern welfare states, trade unions, minimum wages, and working regulations, financial institutions getting support from central banks and governments, other businesses being bailed out by governments, international institutions like the IMF and World Bank lending to poor countries, regulatory authorities like the Federal Maritime Commission, me demanding somewhere indoors to sit in central London. I'm not saying all of these institutions were good and Polanyi himself is critical of some of them, I'm saying they were understandable reactions to the uncertainty and dislocation created by the market economy. They tried to reduce the inherent volatility of markets by providing various kinds of insurance, especially for workers and the poorest, but also for businesses and financial institutions and even whole countries. And also YouTubers who are now full-time and can't rely on the extremely uncertain and insufficient income from YouTube adverts. Polanyi was quite critical of people like Sol, who he said had a tendency to see the double movement as a collectivist conspiracy, demanded by people who didn't understand economics or who were just self-interested actors corrupting the market through state intervention. This is just a denial of expressing wants or needs through other mechanisms than the market. It's a denial of the things markets are unable to do. It is why since the market economy emerged, citizens have sought to put it in its place. As I said a while ago, markets do two useful things at once. First, provide a signal to people that something is in demand. Second, through buying what is demanded, allocate resources to that use so that production can continue and expand. This is a kind of democracy. You want something, you vote for it with your money. More than that, different people can have different desires and a functioning market can fulfill all of them simultaneously by making a variety of goods and services available. If you want to eat British food, that doesn't stop others from being able to eat inferior cuisines like Italian or French food next door. It's a democracy, but it's not the tyranny of the majority, which is what makes it such a fantastic tool. Yet, one dollar, one vote, means that people with more dollars have more votes. We may find our economic landscape dominated by the preferences and decisions of the rich. As Thomas Sowell likes to remind us, resources are scarce, and given locations or neighbourhoods may see housing and shops that serve the poor displaced by those that serve the rich, just because the rich have more voting power in the market. Sol just does not address this point directly, not just with monopolies, but with the more general problem of providing things to people who cannot signal as effectively through the market. You just lost yourself a customer. What? I'm sorry, Homer, I couldn't hear you. I said you just lost yourself a customer. What? You just lost yourself a customer. Homer, you're gonna have to speak up. You just lost yourself a customer, Mo. Capitalism and markets aren't just inherent reflections of scarcity. They restrict people's access to resources in obvious ways. For for example, one of the key limits of distributing resources through markets is that if people do not work, they do not get any market income. As this graph from Matt Brunig shows, non-workers are about half the population in the USA. This includes homemakers, the sick and disabled, the unemployed, the elderly, and children. Having a welfare state which makes payments to these people ensures that they all have access to the market economy because they have a vote. Denying this is sticking your head in the sand, really, yet it's still a widespread belief. I've spoken to civil servants in the UK today who have told me that when consulting with government ministers who are free market ideologues, they often have to remind them that they can't just withdraw support for poor people because those people will actually starve. Not that that seems to bother the Tories too much. To be fair, I don't get the impression that Seoul is against all welfare, and in chapter 4 he seems to suggest something like a universal basic income as a replacement for government programs. But the question of why these things are needed is far from a core part of his analysis. And ultimately, when it comes to the best mixture between market and non-market institutions... You're not going to learn much of this by listening to Thomas Sowell. Returning to the early part of this video, it's clear why Sol had to deny the existence of needs and misrepresent sources to do so. A lot of people have pools. The more subtle omission, though, 
is the emergence of capitalism. Whether it's a dispossessed peasant looking for work in the 18th century, or a dispossessed YouTuber looking for somewhere to sit in the 21st century, markets do not reliably provide the mechanism to link a need with the allocation of that resource. This form of scarcity is not simply reality, it is imposed. And if market economies conflict with the needs of the population, then this throws into question whether they are always the best way of allocating scarce resources which have alternative uses. Does this have consequences for some of the economic questions we've discussed so far? Well... Going into this video, I wanted to give Soul a fair chance. I've already told you that I agree with his mission to teach economics to the masses and that he's basically right about central planning, which is no small issue. I honestly despair sometimes at the number of leftists who are still intent on defending central planning, but again, that's for another video. Generally, I'm not just going to act like everything Sol says is wrong. Large sections of the book are basically descriptive. Tariffs are taxes on imports which serve to raise the price of those imports. <laughs> God, what an idiot. Unfortunately, there's enough in here that's bad that I didn't have to do this deliberately. I actually developed a labelling system for Sol over the course of reading his books, Basic Economics, Applied Economics and Knowledge and Decisions. Most of my notes are substantive, but there are hundreds of them, so I had to find a way to make it easier to categorise and search with a few labels. Check refers to times that I doubt his summary of facts or sources, as with that New York Times article about swimming pools, or when he claims that more demand for milk means that fewer cows will be slaughtered. I'll refrain from going full vegan on you this time. Citation needed refers to times he didn't source an argument at all, as with Alexander the Great, or when he says, evidence has been growing that minimum wage laws harm low-paid workers. Again, next time. Important refers to times where I think a point he's made is crucial to his worldview, as when he emphasises the importance of losses as well as profits like Milton Friedman did, or when he mentions central planning, the first few times. Fair refers to times he made a decent point. For example, the value of these political machines to culturally bewildered and economically desperate people is only underscored by the financial corruption of machine politicians who were re-elected by voters generally well aware of these illegalities. Based refers to times he actually said something really good, as when he advocates governments giving poor people money. Actually, the previous comment should also have been labelled based. Hmm refers to times when something feels off but I wasn't prepared to think about it there and then, maybe because my magnesium glycinate tablets were wearing off. For example, economic organisations provide goods or services in exchange for money. Political organisations provide their services in exchange for votes. Hmm. Next time. And then there's just lol which is when his statements are so silly that I don't need to think about them. An example. Medicines and medical care have both been provided by the government at no charge to the patients in Canada and some other countries, as they once were in China under Mao Zedong and Stalin. <laughs> I told you he was obsessed. You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. <laughs> As I've said repeatedly, Sol is one-sided and unreliable in his use of evidence. We've seen that this kind of cherry-picking is an even bigger problem for Sol than for others because he is committed to the dogmatic view that free market capitalism is almost always the right way of doing things. Even a single, major contradictory example can belie this, as Jeffrey Friedman highlighted so effectively, and as we showed with the example of global logistics. It is the libertarian who is committed to the grand claim that, for some reason, intervention must always be avoided. The exact way Sol is one-sided is interesting in itself. As I mentioned earlier, it's telling that Sol focuses a lot on consumer goods. Whether he's discussing the benefits of American capitalism or the failure of Soviet central planning, he's usually talking about these consumer goods. In a 600-page book, he does of course mention other things, but nowhere near as much, and he remains silent on the toy hedgehogs. It would be wrong to say that capitalism doesn't deliver a wide variety of consumer goods. This may seem trivial in our age of consumerism, but we shouldn't dismiss it. Consumer goods include basic staples and things we like. Captain, I know we usually bury the treasure, but what if this time we use it to buy things? You know, things we like. Sol pays less attention to the areas people usually highlight as failures of capitalism, though. Core infrastructure, utilities, heavy industry, long-term research and development, social insurance, health and education. I've already got a video on the latter three, public services, if you want to check it out, and I directly reference Sol in it. 
But here, I want to stick with industrialization and heavy industry. This is relevant to the question of how capitalism emerged and how growth was sustained. You can see Sol's inability to grapple with complex questions about socialism versus capitalism throughout basic economics. As when discussing ancient history, the Industrial Revolution, or central planning, he has a tendency to paint countries with a broad brush. The contrast between the Soviet economy and the economies of Japan and Germany is just one of many that can be made between economic systems which use prices to allocate scarce resources and those which have relied on political or bureaucratic control. In other regions of the world as well, and in other political systems, there have been similar contrasts between places that used prices to ration goods and allocate resources versus places that have relied on hereditary rulers, elected officials, or appointed planning commissions. Sol's view is, once again, that there are capitalist economies which use markets and prices, and there's more or less everything else which uses top-down planning. Clearly, this doesn't allow for a great deal of understanding of the substantial middle ground between these two, let alone ideas beyond them. It's basically turning a big dial that says capitalism on it and constantly looking back at the audience for approval like a contestant on The Price is Right. Sol goes on. Other countries, India, Germany, China, New Zealand, South Korea, Sri Lanka, have experienced sharp upturns in their economies when they freed those economies from many government controls and relied more on prices to allocate resources. As of 1960, India and South Korea were at comparable economic levels, but by the late 1980s, South Korea's per capita income was 10 times that in India. This paragraph immediately set off my bullshit detector because if I were to choose a good example of a modern complex mixed economy where active government policy aided development, it would be South Korea. Some background. Before 1960, South Korea was recovering from its war with the North as well as its colonization by Japan. They were scared of North Korea, of Japan, and of remaining a poverty-stricken, rural, backwards economy. They wanted to industrialize, and fast. In 1961, General Park Chung-hee seized power in a military coup and would run the country until 1979. In other words, he was in charge for basically all of the period highlighted by Seoul as one of free market reforms. Economist Dwight Perkins described Park's resulting economy as highly interventionist, but with the discipline of having to export, which is instantly a more complex picture than the one painted by Seoul. Park's government promoted a series of national champions called Chables, which controlled whole groups of companies. They chose already successful firms and then nurtured them with low-interest government loans, tax incentives and other advantages. Chables were the origin of household names today like Hyundai, Samsung and Daewoo. The government also launched the Heavy and Chemical Industries Initiative, where government officials directly made investments and managed access to credit. To give you an idea of how intertwined this industry was with the government, General Park was the CEO of the enterprise. Every new year, he had his ministers set out their goals, and the following year, those who had failed to achieve at least 80% of them would be fired. In practice, this meant high growth and expanding the industry relentlessly to keep Park happy. Chables were protected from foreign competition, had access to cheap credit, and even got bailouts during downturns. Through strict oversight and political and legal penalties, Park forced them to become internationally competitive despite the lack of market signals. Times were hard for the ordinary person. Workers faced 60-hour weeks and rigid working conditions, with many union leaders locked up or even killed during this period. Over time, dissatisfaction with the level of corruption and the toughness of the Park regime fermented and eventually... Park was assassinated by the head of the Korean CIA. By the 1980s, South Korea was pursuing more pro-market reforms under the advice of Kim Jae-ik. Kim recognized the achievements of earlier policies, but thought the country had to adapt and change with the times. Fair enough. Then he was killed too. So was this a fantastic regime and something we should all aspire to? Absolutely not, but that's not the point. The question is, what service it does to economic understanding to paint that picture as one of moving towards liberalisation and away from government intervention? Sure, South Korea wasn't North Korea, but it wasn't a free market economy either. What they did in nurturing new industries is sometimes called the infant industry argument, and though it's contested, there are plenty of examples of it working. Seoul devotes exactly two paragraphs to the infant industry argument in basic economics, arguing that it is unlikely that infant industries would be supported because of political reasons. Yet they were. How did I find all of this out, you might ask? Where? Which source was it? What, where did I get the source from? What kind of source did I get? 
of course, it was Thomas Sowell's source. The book is called The Commanding Heights, the battle between government and the marketplace that is remaking the modern world. The exact passage Sowell cited, which compares India to South Korea, reads like this. But in 1987, Singh made his trip to East Asia. He was stunned. The comparisons were astounding. South Korea and India had been at the same economic level in 1960. Now, South Korea's per capita income was 10 times that of India, and it was applying for membership in the OECD. Singh struggled to understand what had made the difference. In East Asia, the government's engaged in what he called promotional activities, supporting businesses, whereas in India, the emphasis was on regulation. But perhaps the most striking difference of all was the degree to which East Asian countries had oriented themselves toward international trade and captured its benefits, while India had insisted on turning inward. So, yes, international trade and markets aided South Korea and beat India's complete autarky. Selling stuff to the world market, exporting, is still the best known way to finance early industrialization. You won't get much disagreement from me that this is a better way to run an economy than turning away from the world entirely, as India did. But 100 pages before this passage, there is a detailed discussion of South Korea and how complex its industrialization policy was. Even in the quoted passage, they note that the government promoted businesses. When a government deliberately picks the industries it wants to grow, gets heavily involved in the day-to-day -day running of those businesses, legislates minimum working days and bans unions, it's shallow and unhelpful to argue that over this period, the economy was moving more towards a free market system. If these strategies were successful, then obviously, the free market system is not always the best at allocating scarce resources which have alternative uses. The Commanding Heights is a largely pro-free market, pro-globalization book. It was written at the height of post-Cold War triumphalism. Although I would criticize the book for its pro-market spin, it is very good on the detail. Another book you might want to look at to understand the triumph of South Korea and the other East Asian tigers like Taiwan is How Asia Works by Joe Studwell. It's a really complex picture, a combination of capitalism and government policy, historical luck, and each time adapted to the particularities of a given country. Let's return to the idea, which we discussed right at the beginning, that Seoul arrived at his views because of empirical evidence. One article recalls Seoul being critical of economist Gunnar Myrdal's theories of development, which emphasized the role of an active state. I got no sense that Myrdal actually investigated these theories of his and compared them with anything that actually happened. I myself, of course, started out on the left and believed a lot of this stuff, the one thing that saved me was that I always thought facts mattered. And once you think that facts matter, then of course, that's a very different ballgame. Obviously, an investigation of the facts about South Korea leads to conclusions radically different to Seoul's. Now, I'm not going to argue that every example he gives is wrong. He mentions a number of countries, and in some of them he may have a point, especially with India, which was way too interventionist in all the wrong ways. But the debate over what makes countries grow and industrialize is extremely contentious, and I just don't trust Seoul after checking out his sources for the countries I already knew something about. With both the USSR and South Korea, his own sources fail to support his simplistic narrative, and that's before you even go into other sources that contradict him. The so-called new industrial policy that modern economists are pushing these days, for example. You could even say, You're not going to be learning any of this from reading Thomas Sowell. Governments in more successful countries were active players in supporting infant industries and markets, not to mention social safety nets. The economist Danny Roderick has long emphasized the symbiotic role between governments and markets. It turns out that having a strong public sector and participating more in the global economy seem to be mutually reinforcing. Whichever way I cut the data, I found a strong positive correlation between a nation's exposure to international trade and the size of its government. Where was this correlation coming from? I considered many possible explanations, but none survived my battery of tests. In the end, the evidence seemed to point strongly towards a social insurance motive. People demand compensation against risk when their economies are more exposed to international economic forces and governments respond by erecting broader safety nets, either through social programs or through public employment, which is more typical in poor nations. This is where Polanyi's double movement comes home to roost. Market economies do not guarantee people a stable income, education, healthcare, or fulfill other needs. This is simply because not everyone can access these things consistently, as they depend on having money, or on the decisions of those who do have money. As more and more of our lives become dependent on the market economy, 
we require access to it. If we don't have access to it, then, well, what happened here? I'll tell you what happened. Russia moved away from its centrally planned economy in 1991 as the Soviet system collapsed. In line with advice from free marketeers, they suddenly adopted a market economy without any of the corresponding social safety nets almost overnight. There was a huge economic and social collapse with a falling GDP, a rise in poverty, and this precipitous fall in life expectancy in the early 90s. This approach has since become known as shock therapy and it doesn't work. Oh, fantastic. The exact causes of the big drop in life expectancy in the former USSR are still debated, and the data are not where we'd like them to be. Research generally highlights a massive rise in stress over this period, which led to many causes of death such as heart failures and strokes. Stress and despair have been directly linked to declining employment opportunities and increased poverty and inequality over this period. There was a rise in alcohol consumption, itself in large part a response to stress. In other words, Russia tried to transition to a market economy, but had no insurance against its excesses, which were especially pronounced during such a big upheaval. Polanyi had once again come home to roost. I found one interview where Sol claims that Russian capitalism did not count as real capitalism. In Russia... Uh, when, when the uh, new capitalists were simply the old communists who had taken over the uh, industries, uh, you didn't have uh, capitalism in the real sense of the word. You had what some have called crony capitalism. Uh, and you had people who disappear off the streets when they, uh, you know, get, get in the way of what the government wants to do. I find this pretty interesting for the same country where Seoul would presumably reject the not real socialism argument. The attempt to force a rapid transition to a market economy deserves scrutiny, just as the attempt to force a rapid transition to a centrally planned economy does. And people being taken off the streets for getting in the way of the government? That happened in South Korea too, yet it still grew. In basic economics, Seoul thankfully hints at pragmatism over shock therapy, with an example of how markets were not yet developed enough in Russia. Food can be in short supply in a country with extraordinarily fertile soil, as in a post-communist Russia that had not yet achieved a free market economy. All that was lacking in Russia was a market to connect the hungry city with the products of the fertile land and a government that would allow such a market to function freely. But, in some places, Local Russian officials forbade the movement of food across local boundary lines in order to assure low food prices within their own jurisdictions and therefore local political support for themselves. This pragmatism is welcome but unconvincing. Seoul uses two sources here and both of them are newspaper articles rather than the kind of rigorous research we just discussed. The period covered is also the late 90s rather than the shock therapy period, so its relevance to the dip in life expectancy just after the collapse of the Soviet Union is questionable. Seoul's first source is a Wall Street Journal article, which as far as I can tell supports his claim that corrupt officials were inhibiting trade. But his second source is a San Francisco Chronicles article, which shows the situation is a little more complex than he is letting on. The article does argue that the markets are not well established in the Russian heartlands and that Russian politicians are corrupt. Yet it also contains calls for more infrastructure, government subsidies, and cites the collapse of the Russian currency, the ruble, as a major factor in preventing the production and distribution of food. We used to have a fair amount of trade with people who came up the highway from Belarus and Ukraine, said Byolozorov, but the ruble so unstable they've disappeared. The Plava Valley's struggling agricultural private sector and its miserable infrastructure of pothole roads, 50-year-old electrification grids, and leaky irrigation systems reflect a nationwide pattern. We'll generously give Sol a 5 out of 10 for his representation of these sources. They do contain the claims he makes, but as usual, there's more to it than free markets good. You can't claim all that was lacking was a market when free-floating currency plus a lack of government intervention are directly implicated in your sources. Even the Wall Street Journal article mentions the weak ruble. It was a really important driver of economic conditions in Russia over the 90s. I recommend Moscow, where the American dollar buys 7 rubles, 12 rubles, 60 rubles, 1,000 rubles, I must go! Overall, the academic research about the 90s in Russia highlights the collapse of state employment and support as creating a situation where people couldn't meet their needs. Markets were liberalized and then capital fled the country. State pensions were not paid. Jobs disappeared. The currency collapsed. When centrally planned price controls were lifted, 
Food prices rose at an astonishing rate, along with inflation in general, so naturally people had trouble feeding themselves. Oligarchs became rich following privatization, an issue which still haunts Russia to this day. These are all how capitalism functions in the absence of state intervention. It can be extremely unequal and extremely volatile. Markets were expected to fill the gap magically somehow, but they failed because they weren't managed and complemented properly. This stemmed from corruption and also a poor understanding of how markets work, of what they can and can't do. Even well-functioning markets do not provide reliable support and employment for everyone. You can see that the countries that used governments effectively did better than the ones that just assumed markets would fill the gap. It's not just South Korea that has used heavy government investment to shield its population and businesses from the worst of the market, either. Danny Roderick's favourite case study is China, which by some measures is now the largest economy in the world. In 1978, Chinese grain production was centrally planned, as in the Soviet Union. Instead of adopting shock therapy, they went with a pragmatic approach. A Western trained economist would have recommended abolishing the plans and removing all price controls. Yet, without the quotas, urban workers would be deprived of their cheap rations and the government of an important source of revenue. There would be masses of disgruntled workers in the cities and the government would have to resort to printing money, risking hyperinflation. The Chinese solution to this conundrum was to graft a market system on top of the plan. Communes were abolished and family farming restored, but land remained state property. Obligatory grain deliveries at controlled prices were also kept in place, but once farmers had fulfilled the state quota, they were now free to sell their surplus at market-determined prices. This dual-track regime gave farmers market-based incentives, and yet did not dispossess the state from its revenue, or the urban workers from their sheep food. Agricultural productivity rose sharply, setting off the first phase of China's post-1978 growth. There were also township and village enterprises led by local governments, highly restrictive tariffs, and other barriers to trade, massive state investment and subsidies, and countless other direct interventions. What is Seoul's summary of this extremely complex and interventionist set of policies? In contrast to China's severe economic problems when there was heavy-handed government control under Mao, who died in 1976, the subsequent freeing up of prices in the marketplace led to an astonishing economic growth rate of 9% per year between 1978 and 1995. Make no mistake, China now is capitalist, but it is not and has never been an example of free market capitalism. Markets in China have been constructed and complemented, constrained and curtailed from 1978 until today. Markets in China have been put in their place. If you ignore the undoubted benefits of market economies, then you end up with Soviet-style central planning, which is inefficient, morally reprehensible, and, you know, just doesn't work. If you ignore the importance of non-market institutions and Polanyi's double movement, then you end up with Russian shock therapy. It is an unfortunate coincidence of history that Russia has had to endure both of these horrible, failed experiments. Now, you could interpret everything I'm saying as a simple call for a middle ground between capitalism and socialism, and in some ways it is, if you define capitalism to be ultra-free market capitalism and socialism to be central planning. But it goes much further than that. What I'm saying is that Seoul's framework is fundamentally wrong about how markets work, and I want to introduce you to one final notion, which I think brings everything we've spoken about together. Markets as sites of governance. I said it brought everything together, I didn't say it sounded exciting. What do you think of when you think of a market? For most people, their minds will probably turn to physical markets, a farmer's market where people buy and sell local produce, an auction market where people bid on antiques and art, or the stock market where people buy and sell financial assets. The term market has a much broader usage than that today. It captures literally any spot exchange with a buyer and a seller. That is, you bring the goods, I bring the money, I buy the goods with the money, and the whole transaction is settled straight away on the spot. Market relationships extend to every facet of our lives. We buy food, clothing, shelter, jewelry, holidays, cars, and much more, sometimes in person, but usually online. These days, mobile apps have seen previously non-monetized areas of life such as dating, dog walking, and friendship opened up to the marketplace. Sol's approach is generally to treat markets as running according to universal principles, the interplay of supply and demand allocating scarce resources which have alternative uses according to the principle of substitution. As E.P. Thompson pointed out, though, 
This abstraction may not be that helpful. Too often, the discourse about the market conveys the sense of something definite, a space or constitution of exchange, when in fact, sometimes unknown to the term's user, it is being employed as a metaphor of economic process, or an idealization or abstraction from that process. Whichever market you take, there are generally a whole range of both formal and informal rules which govern it. Buyers and sellers must make their exchanges somehow, but facilitating this is far from easy. There are the usual concerns. Can I trust this person? Is the exchange secure from threats? Who will enforce these rules? But it goes beyond that. When producing, exchanging, and distributing a surplus, every market needs to have rules that ensure that people are properly coordinated, that more powerful actors do not abuse the system, and that production can be relied upon to continue. The system has to reproduce itself, and to do this, it has to tend to the needs of not just people, but businesses. The economist Hajun Chang has compared the idea of the free market to 20th century kung fu fighters, who seemingly floated through the air during fights. Of course, spoilers, they were generally hanging on piano wires. They couldn't really jump that far. Just like the Kung Fu fighters, what we see as free or natural markets are often propped up by myriad rules. People often uh, say that our oh, stock markets are the, the free markets, but you know, do you think you can turn up at London Stock Exchange with a bag of shares and uh, sell it on the, the doorsteps? No, I mean, uh, you have to go through you know, rigorous uh, the, uh, vetting process in terms of uh, your you know, company accounts and so on. Commodities exchanges are a good example of an ideal market, and trading commodities like barley and wool is one of the oldest kinds of market, which is why they were even present in ancient Babylon. In modern exchanges, there are many buyers and sellers bidding on commodities. People are trading continuously and have a wide range of choices. They are usually experts and have access to the best knowledge available. In other words, there are no obvious market failures here. Yet the exchange is replete with rules, not least the one that all trading must take place within it. People are not free to trade commodities anywhere, they have to do so through the exchange itself. The securities exchange is one of the best examples of an idealised market, yet it is an organised market which is licensed and regulated by the government, run day to day by a private entity, the exchange itself. Tankus and Harin summarize just how badly this exchange fits the abstract notion of the market. Market specialists, meanwhile, manage their order flow to avoid impacting the spot price of the item they are buying or selling. Spot prices in chartered commodities exchanges must be carefully managed because of their reverberating impact on the price setting processes in related and connected markets. Averages of spot prices at a given time on a given day are often used as pricing benchmarks in longer term contracts that happen off exchange or off reporter. They must be orderly enough to allow continuous production, investment and sales to occur without the constant need for readjustment of terms. Breaching these kinds of rules inhibits trading itself and even when legal, is deemed a significant problem and is clamped down upon. The market is constructed by the very rules that govern it. It wouldn't work in anything like a recognisable form if it were just free, whatever that would mean. Turning up in some back alley and trading rights to commodities and futures in secret just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't be reliable. You need rules for how buyers and sellers exchange and how they manage orders. Otherwise, you just have anarchy. And I mean the bad kind of anarchy. Martin, you're up one million dollars. Yes! And now you've lost all but six hundred dollars. We've seen from Polanyi that market exchange always has a context. People do better economically with guaranteed access to their basic needs. These needs evolve and change over time, but they are relatively easy to define at any given moment. They're usually the product of economic, social, and political circumstances. This is why almost every modern market economy has various public institutions which aim to protect access to healthcare, education, travel, and to prevent poverty. Governments do their best to buffer citizens and institutions from the volatility of markets. Countries that want to industrialize protect their industries from global capitalism. We as a society try to put markets in their place. But paradoxically, so do markets themselves. Given the characteristic volatility of financial markets, there is the ever-present threat of crashes. For this reason, if prices drop too far, too fast, then the exchange just ceases trading, as the Planet Money intern demonstrated in the best economics video ever created. Oh no, the stock market's going down. The stock market goes down too much. That's not very chill. 
Oh, but it can. The New York Stock Exchange has a built-in circuit breaker, or what I like to call chill session. If the S&P drops 7% in one day, the market will be halted for 15 minutes. Too, too quick. And this extends beyond financial markets. The economist Frederick Lee argued it applied generally to industrial competition. The most important form of potential instability in a market is price competition. And a major objective of the enterprises in markets is to produce a form of competition that will produce a stable market. Business means avoiding the kinds of price changes that people like Seoul appeal to as essential for coordinating the economy. Seoul's argument for markets is centered around the universal adjustment of prices, allocating resources to their most valued uses, whether that means milk, ice cream, cheese, or yogurt. Remember his milk example from earlier in the video? When I was hungry, <laughs> we all laughed. But at some point, the laughter has to stop. One of the big facts that standard economics still struggles with, in my opinion, is that prices just don't change as much as they'd need to in order to allocate supply and demand. Markets don't clear. Supply doesn't match demand in many cases. It is well accepted that prices, and especially wages, don't move as much as core economic theory implies, that they are what's called sticky. But this is often grafted onto the core theory instead of asking what good sticky prices and wages may do for economic actors. Businesses need guarantees like everyone else. This means agreed prices which hold for long periods of time. It means sustained relationships with buyers, sellers and workers. Every business and the market it operates in is continually engaged in a process of trying to create certainty within the volatile market economy. Sol understands this in one way. At the start of his chapter on monopolies, he quotes Friedrich Bastiat as saying, Competition always has been and always will be troublesome to those who have to meet it. You can take this in the direction of arguing that the market process will gradually weed out those who are not serving consumers, and there's obvious truth to this. But those who succeed in conquering competition end up with a disproportionate level of control over our economies, like Maersk and the other massive shipping companies. This is just bad economic governance, as it no longer responds to the needs of those with less money or less control over the market. It is the unequal democracy of the market in action. It's easy to look at market economies as natural. Markets as one thing where decisions are made and prices are created by decentralized actors. But they contain countless complexities in who makes the decisions about what is produced, how it is produced, and crucially, what prices are. Prices are key for Seoul. They're a reflection of natural scarcity. But real price setting is often downstream of explicit legal decisions which seem invisible to us because we take them for granted. Sanjuk to Paul uses the example of trucking. The trucking firm gets to set the prices it charges its customers for trucking services. That seems natural enough, but is it? Functionally, this is a form of price coordination. The firm is setting the prices for the services performed by all, say, 20 drivers. Imagine that in this particular market for trucking services, there are four other firms of 20 drivers each. Now suppose that instead of working for the firm, these same 20 drivers begin working directly for customers, but form a bargaining unit for the purpose of negotiating their contracts with customers. They agree internally upon rates, and they do not deviate from rates set by their designated bargaining agent, without changing much, if anything at all, about the tangible economic activity that is taking place, we have moved from a situation in which the price coordination is uncontroversially permitted to one that courts and federal competition authorities would undoubtedly label a garden variety price fixing ring. When a bunch of truckers get together and fix prices, it's a cartel and goes against antitrust law. But when they get together inside a corporation and fix prices, well, that's just normal. Paul calls this the firm exception because firms get away with what is effectively collusion within their own boundaries. Herbert Simon, once remarked that if an alien came to visit planet Earth, they would not see a wide range of markets and conclude that we live in a market economy. They'd see a wide range of organizations and conclude that we live in an organizational economy, whether looking at capitalist or communist countries. Most economic activity is done within the boundaries of firms and other organizations, not between them. If firms were green and markets were red, Simon argued that the Martian would see large green areas interconnected by red lines, as opposed to a network of red lines connecting green spots. The modern corporation is itself a legally granted monopoly, and its purpose has changed over time. 
Tankus and Harin state, Before the 19th century, incorporation was a highly specific legal privilege, used either for major infrastructure investments, such as mills, roads, or bridges, or for extending networks of global trade and colonialism. In either case, corporations were conceptualized as express public grants of coordination rights, indeed of monopoly power, over some domain of the social provisioning process. Although they could be, and often were, renewed, these grants were restricted in time, place, and purpose, and the corporate form was itself designed as a political institution that accorded to aristocratic republican principles of good governance. The organization of these corporations is hugely important to the functioning of the economy. Modern corporations, especially Anglo-American ones, tend to prioritize shareholders. Shareholders expect a return on their investment, but they also control who manages the firm, voting in the CEO or the board that elects the CEO. It's easy to see these two functions as coming together, but that hasn't always been the case. Even today, some firms have Class B shareholders who can invest and get dividends, but who do not have a vote over the running of the company. Hajun Chang notes that when the Swedish car company Volvo set up in South Korea, they were unable to operate because they were used to having strong unions and workers present on the boards. Their way of producing cars happened to include workers in the decision process, whereas somewhere like Daewoo was much more capital-oriented, owing to South Korea's capital-friendly history. These are political choices that we make about how our economies are governed, and there's no escaping them. It leads to very interesting debates, but actually, you might learn something about them from reading Thomas Sowell. I'll hand it to him. He's not too bad on legal history, and I'll give him his due in part two. Sowell acknowledges the importance of corporate governance in basic economics, though he doesn't give anywhere near enough space to explore different approaches and how this all might affect our fundamental understanding of economics. It's ancillary for Sol. For us, the real economic problem is not so much allocating scarce resources which have alternative uses, no matter how many times you repeat that phrase. It's coordinating production, distribution and exchange so that the economic system can function properly and reproduce itself, while serving everyone's needs as far as possible. This means asking who is entitled to the proceeds of production, who controls production, and crucially, who sets prices. When people call for things like a living wage or rent controls, they're implicitly arguing that the current market has broken down and that some prices, in this case wages and rents, are not being set in everyone's interests. These debates are usually the most vociferous with Polanyi's fictitious commodities of money, labour and land because those are the most directly related to human needs. If you think the implication of this argument is that all economic rules are arbitrary and they can be changed however you like, then I haven't done my job properly. These institutions are the source of the historically unprecedented, sustained rise in the surplus available to humanity. But we need to understand them properly to make sure this sustained surplus is managed with humanity's interests at heart. If you think that the solution is to get rid of markets entirely and have governments do all the planning directly, then you haven't been doing your job of listening. Central planning was a lousy form of economic governance, but that's all it was. This may be a less exciting or comforting conclusion than the USSR disobeyed the laws of economics. Proper evaluation of the USSR can help us beyond lazily using the failure of central planning as an argument for free markets. The abstract notion of the market has distracted us from truly understanding basic economics. It's not basic, it's simplistic and wrong. Through case study after case study, Alexander the Great, hunter-gatherer societies, the Industrial Revolution, modern shipping, the fate of Russia and the growth of East Asia, financial markets and corporate governance. I've tried to convince you that understanding economics requires more than applying a fixed set of laws and concepts. It requires detailed historical analysis. The so-called laws of economics are, well, not. They're not a cold hard truth or reality coming home to knock. Scarcity exists, but so does surplus, and how that surplus is allocated is constructed by the institutions that govern the economy. How the economy is constructed affects the scarcity that is experienced by families, businesses and governments. A middle-class American couple struggling to pay their mortgage can be overcome with good policy, even if that's just giving them money. Wow, a lot of people have pools. Just as we can apply Jeffrey Friedman's pragmatic approach to seeing where markets work and where governments work, we can take a further step back and ask the question, what exactly are we looking at here? Is it best defined as a market or a government, or do we need to see these all as institutions that are governed by fundamentally different mechanics? 
We can therefore question who has the power in a given situation and who the market is serving. Whether coordination is breaking down in counterproductive ways, as in global logistics over the pandemic. Sol and others have got the way markets and capitalism function completely wrong. Economic governance entails ensuring that all of the different actors in an economy are coordinated so that production can continue to take place in a way that serves everyone as best as possible. Abstract notions of markets are almost entirely useless for this purpose. Polanius notions of constructed markets and their relation to the reproduction of people and businesses, however, come into their own. The potential volatility of many markets is in direct opposition to the continued functioning of the economic system, which is why so many areas of the economy, whether public or private, shield themselves from this volatility one way or another. This perspective can't be fit neatly into just having a left-wing view of markets, although it's obviously left of Thomas Sowell. He repeatedly expresses incredulity that competition authorities worry when prices are too low. According to Sowell, Lower prices are just the result of competition and benefit consumers. But from our perspective, prices that are too low can be destructive as they endanger existing firms, not to mention workers and other social or environmental goals. This is why competition authorities used to be more worried about low prices. They inhibited the continued functioning and reproduction of the economy. In a way, capitalism sometimes needs to be protected from itself. This is a complex point to be sure, and in the next video I want to go more into theories of knowledge, governance and markets and how Sol gets them wrong. He believes, after all, that market competition is the best way of managing these problems and any interferences are just motivated by the economically illiterate or those who seek political gain. Hopefully, I've persuaded you that there are plenty of cases where this isn't true in the current video, but we still need to go into more depth on the background of this idea to do it justice. As you can see from the windows behind me, the sun has set on this absurdly lengthy video. But wait a minute. Escaping from oversimplified notions of how markets work, especially in the Polanius realms of land, labor, and capital, price controls? Didn't I make a video on this a while back? Wasn't that video still my most controversial yet? Didn't it spark a lot of furious responses? Well, you know what that means for part two, everyone. It's time for some old beef. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. This has been a long time coming. People who have been following the channel for a while will know that. I tried to acknowledge the massive weight in the intro, and hopefully this very long video, uh, as well as the promise of an equally long follow-up, uh, you know, later this year, will be enough to uh, keep you going. So, thank you very much to Hobby, uh for the amazing intro and uh the the song and thank you very much uh to ben uh, my new editor uh, so i hope you liked the new editing it's slightly different there's a bit more um punching in and edits and stuff that that i really liked uh thank you most of all really to my patrons who should be scrolling by the screen as you're watching this uh they've been very patient uh, those who have sort of stuck with me as I developed this video over the course of six or so months. And thank you very much to my animators too, uh, Sorsha, and uh, to Grim Freeberg. And also thank you very much to everyone who did quote. So uh, FD Signifier, uh, Mia Mulder, Plain Bagel, uh, Sorsha, the animator also did some quotes, and to uh, Matt Brunig. So yeah. In case it wasn't clear, the next video is going to be more about uh, the idea of economics and knowledge and how that works and operates through markets or through other systems, states versus markets, our visions of how the economy works. Um, it's maybe going to be slightly more abstract, although it's not going to be like super theoretical. Uh, but I want to touch much more on Sol's views of intellectuals and his, his vision of the world. Um, because I think there's a, a pretty obvious problem and contradiction in, in those things because he seems to think of himself as outside what it means to be an intellectual and he really hates intellectuals, uh, but he himself has a specific vision of the world. But anyway, that's the preview. And 
is is the uh <laughs> to the comment on the cliffhanger is it gonna be just old beef i mean you know me guys i, I don't i don't engage in drama too much uh, but it would just be it'd be nice to follow up on the econ 101 video because demand supply is a fundamental vision of the world and a lot of people uh criticize that um people who didn't really know what they were talking about and who seem to misunderstand the main message partly on me if you get misunderstood but also i don't think those people really know what they were talking about or that they're acting in good faith so there's that wait and see Bye.